on Friday the 10th through Sunday of that week when the, that systemic risk exception was announced. Again, did the FDIC chair use all the tools at his disposal to resolve the banks that weekend? Was there a viable private sector solution? Uh, there are reports that multiple banks were interested and ran the traps internally to purchase Silicon Valley Bank that weekend. Uh, you confirmed as much uh, yesterday, uh, Chairman Grunberg. Uh, but as we all know, Silicon Valley Bank was not purchased until late Sunday, March 26th, at an estimated $20 billion in losses to the deposit insurance fund. Why wasn't a potential buyer accepted sooner? Was there an ideological lens that prevented the FDIC from pursuing a private sector solution that could have staved off the uncertainty of the last two weeks? We know on Sunday, March 12th, another bank is shuttered and placed into FDIC receivership. And together, this is deemed a systemic risk event. That evening, the Financial Stability Oversight Council meets in executive session. No meeting minutes, no transparency for the public, just an announcement after the fact. That lack of transparency has a negative effect on the public view of the safety of the financial uh, arena. Congress needs visibility in, into how and why this determination was made by the FDIC, the Fed, the Treasury Secretary, the FSOC Chair, and the President. I'll finish with this. We need competent financial supervisors, but Congress can't legislate competence. Today, this committee wants to understand your thinking in those key moments and that decision-making uh, in a moment of stress in our banking system. Thank you for being here and your willingness to give uh, answers to our questions. At least that's the hope. With that, I now recognize the ranking member uh, for four minutes. Good morning. I'd like to thank Chairman McHenry for working with me in a bipartisan way on investigating the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Today's hearing is the first of what I expect to be several hearings on this important topic. Chair Guenberg, Vice Chair Barr, and Under Secretary Lang, the collapse of SVB and Signature Bank earlier this month marked the second and third largest bank failures in U.S. history. In fact, SVB customers withdrew a staggering $42 billion in less than a day, making it the largest bank run ever and threatening to snowball into a full-blown uh, banking crisis. But 2023 is not 2008 because of the Dodd-Frank reforms Democrats on this committee passed, as well as the bold and swift response by President Biden. Secretary Yellen and our banking regulators, a crisis was averted and our banking system remains strong. However, these events are a wake-up call. We must uncover how management, regulatory, and supervisory failures contributed to these events and explore solutions to strengthen the safety and soundness of our banks. Small business owners should not be expected to serve as a financial regulator when paying their employees and community banks and minority depository institutions should not have to pay for the failures of bank mismanagement at SVB or Signature Bank. Since day one, SVB's collapse, committee Democrats have been on the case. In fact, under my leadership a ranking member, as ranking member, we quickly organized several bipartisan briefings with our nation's regulators to better understand what happened, share what we were hearing from constituents and urge regulators to act. Since then, we've sent letters demanding answers from our regulators. And in response to Biden's call to Congress, I and my colleagues are working on legislation to, for example, enhance clawbacks and other penalties. We also need answers from the CEOs who not only ran these banks into the ground, but enriched themselves. It is also important to know how we got here. Deregulation. Former and disgraced President Trump said he'd do a, and I'll quote, a big number on Dodd-Frank and his appointed regulators did just that. At that time, I sounded the alarm on the dangers of weakening capital and liquidity rules for banks like SVP. The light touch cautions 
from the Fed to SBB management are clearly not what Congress intended for bank supervision. I hope Republicans will join Democrats in strengthening compliance with bank rules and transparency over this process. Before I close, I want to address the extreme mega Republican narrative about the bank failures. Let me be very, very clear. Silicon Valley Bank collapsed because of management failures and possible regulatory weaknesses, not because there was one black man on the board. We saw the same racist playbook during the 2008 financial crisis when some Republicans blamed the Community Reinvestment Act and loans made to people of color. Rest assured, Democrats will not stand for this blatant racism. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. We'll now recognize the Vice Chair of the full committee, Mr. Hill, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we're confronted with the results after 10 years of too loose monetary policy and recent wildly excessive spending. Some bank management teams have forgotten their prudential obligations to their depositors and their shareholders. And clearly, many customers forgot their own prudence and their own financial responsibility. But as our committee comes together, the chair, the ranking member, and members are concerned about the supervisory failures by the regulators who are supposed to keep a watchful eye. Some lawmakers have been quick to use this crisis to put politics to push their preferred policy outcomes. But that's premature. We need to first understand what happened, when, and why, both leading up to the bank failures as well as the decisions made by your agencies represented in our panel today in response. Only then can we decide the proper path forward. That's why Republicans are conducting a comprehensive review, starting with oversight letters to the Federal Reserve, the San Francisco Fed, the FDIC, the FSOC, the California and New York State regulators. We expect your full cooperation in this matter, and make no mistake, today's hearing is just a first step in that process. I thank the Chair for the hearing, and I yield back. The Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions and Monetary Policy, Mr. Foster, for one minute. Thank you, Chair McHenry and Ranking Member Waters for convening at this crucial time, and thank you to our esteemed witnesses for being here today. I remain proud of what we did almost 13 years ago with the Dodd-Frank Act. Although COVID presented novel and considerable challenges to our banking system, the system held. And these recent events represent the first real stress event since the 2008 crisis, when the banks dealt with run risk and serious liquidity concerns. What we've learned is that we now have to reinforce our banking system against bank runs that can occur at the speed of the Internet. This will require stronger emergency liquidity provision to banks under attack, and it has to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This will then require liquidity providers to have a clear and simple means of knowing that, that they are loaning to an entity which will ultimately remain solvent. I also believe that we have a lot to learn by the two side-by-side -side <coughs> bank failures, Silicon Valley Bank with total assets less than 1% of GDP, and Credit Suisse with total assets greater than 100% of Swiss GDP. Um, and the difference, I believe, is contingent capital. Had we followed Congress's direction to include contingent capital into the stacks of, of U.S. large banks, we would have been able to resolve uh, the SVB without hitting the deposit insurance fund. And I'll be bringing that up in my questions and yield back. Today we'll hear testimony from the Honorable Michael S. Barr, Vice Chair of Supervision of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the Honorable Martin J. Grunberg, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Honorable Nellie Lang, of Undersecretary for Domestic Finance of the U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, we thank each of you for your time, uh, and we're going to be recognized for five minutes for our oral presentation of your written testimony. Uh, we'll begin with you, uh, Mr. Barr. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and other members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Federal Reserve Supervisory and Regulatory Oversight of Silicon Valley Bank. Our banking system is sound and resilient, with strong capital and liquidity. The Federal Reserve, working with the Treasury Department and FDIC, mm -hmm. took decisive actions to protect the U.S. economy and to strengthen public confidence in our banking system. These actions demonstrate that we are committed to ensuring that all deposits are safe. That we will continue to closely monitor conditions in the banking system 
and are prepared to use all of our tools for any size institution as necessary. Uh, if, if the gentleman will dispense for a second. Uh, Mr. Foster, you'll turn off your mic. Thank you. Uh, we'll let you continue. Thank you. Shall I proceed? Oh, all right. Go ahead. If everybody will check your mics and make sure you're off. Did you did you just do that to Mr. Torres? All right. See, we can even have a sense of humor in the midst of serious <laughs> stuff. Uh, we'll let you continue. Thank you, Vice Chair Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will continue to closely monitor conditions in the banking system and are prepared to use all of our tools for any size institution as needed to keep the system safe and sound. At the same time, the events of the last few weeks raise questions about what more can be done and should be done so that isolated banking problems do not undermine confidence in healthy banks and threaten the stability of the banking system as a whole. At the forefront of my mind is the importance of maintaining the strength and diversity of banks of all sizes that serve communities across the country. SBB failed because the bank's management did not effectively manage its interest rate and liquidity risk. And the bank then suffered a devastating and unexpected run by its uninsured depositors in a period of less than 24 hours. Immediately following SVB's failure, Chair Powell and I agreed that I should oversee a review of the circumstances leading up to SVB's failure. In this review, we are looking at SVB's growth and management, our own supervisory engagement with the bank, and the regulatory requirements that applied to the bank. The picture that has emerged thus far shows SVB had inadequate risk management and internal controls that struggled to keep pace with the growth of the bank. Supervisors began delivering supervisory warnings near the end of 2021. Our review will consider whether these supervisory warnings were sufficient and whether supervisors had sufficient tools to escalate them. We are also focusing on whether the Federal Reserve supervision was appropriate for the rapid growth and vulnerabilities of the bank. While the Federal Reserve framework focuses on size thresholds, size is not always a good proxy for risk, particularly when a bank has a non-traditional business model. Turning to regulation, we are evaluating whether application of more stringent standards would have prompted the bank to better manage the risk that led to its failure. We are also assessing whether SVB would have had higher levels of capital and liquidity under higher standards, and whether such higher levels of capital and liquidity could have forestalled the bank's failure or provided further resilience to the bank. We need to move forward with our work to improve the resilience of the banking system, including the Basel III endgame reforms, a long-term debt requirement for large banks, and enhancements to stress testing with multiple scenarios so that it captures a wider range of risk and uncovers channels for contagion, like those we saw in the recent series of events. We must also explore changes to our liquidity rules and other reforms to improve the resiliency of the financial system. In addition, recent events have shown that we must evolve our understanding of banking in light of changing technologies and emerging risks. Part of the Federal Reserve's core mission is to promote the safety and soundness of the banks we supervise, as well as the stability of the financial system to help ensure that the system supports a healthy economy for U.S. households, businesses, and communities. Deeply interrogating SVB's failure and probing its broader implications is critical to our responsibility for upholding that mission. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. We'll now recognize Chairman Grunberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee, Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today to address the federal regulator's response to the recent bank failures. On March 10th, just over two weeks ago, Silicon Valley Bank, or SVV as it's known, with $209 billion in assets at year end 2022, was closed by the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, which then appointed the FDIC as receiver. The failure of SVB following the March 8th announcement by Silvergate Bank that it would voluntarily liquidate signaled the possibility of a contagion effect on other banks. On Sunday, March 12th, just two days after the failure of SVB, another institution, Signature Bank of New York, 
with $110 billion in assets at year-end 2022, was closed by the New York State Department of Financial Services, which also appointed the FDIC as receiver. With other institutions experiencing stress, serious concerns arose about a broader economic spillover from these failures. After careful analysis and deliberation, the boards of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve voted unanimously to recommend, and the Treasury Secretary, in consultation with the President, determined that the FDIC could use emergency systemic risk authorities under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act to fully protect all depositors in winding down SVB and Signature Bank. It's worth noting that these two inst institutions were allowed to fail. Shareholders lost their investment, unsecured creditors took losses, the boards and the most senior executives were removed, the FDIC has authority to investigate and hold accountable the directors and officers of the banks for the losses they caused to the banks and for any misconduct in the management of the banks, and the FDIC has already commenced those investigations. Further, any losses to the FDIC's deposit insurance fund as a result of uninsured deposit insurance coverage will be repaid by a special assessment on banks as required by law. The FDIC has now completed the sale of both bridge banks to acquiring institutions. My written testimony today describes the events leading up to the failures of SVB and Signature Bank and the facts and circumstances that prompted the decision to utilize the authority in the Federal Deposit Insurance Act to protect all depositors in those banks following those failures. It further describes the management and disposition of the bridge institutions that were established. It also discusses the FDIC's assessment of the current state of the U.S. financial system, which remains sound despite these events. And in addition, it shares some preliminary lessons learned as we look back on the immediate aftermath of this episode. In that regard, the FDIC will undertake a comprehensive review of the deposit insurance system and will release a report by May 1 that will include policy options for consideration related to deposit insurance coverage levels, excess deposit insurance, and the implications for risk-based pricing and, and deposit insurance fund adequacy. In addition, the FDIC's chief, chief risk officer will undertake a review of the FDIC supervision of Signature Bank and will also release a report by May 1. Further, the FDIC will issue in May a proposed rulemaking with a special assessment for public comment. The bank failures demonstrate the implications that banks with assets over $100 billion can have for financial stability. The prudential regulation of these institutions merits serious attention, particularly for capital liquidity and interest rate risk, and also the consideration of a long-term debt requirement to facilitate orderly resolution. Recent efforts to stabilize the banking system and stem potential contagion from these failures have ensured that depositors will continue to have access to their savings, that small businesses and other employers can continue to make payrolls, and that other banks, small, medium, and large, can continue to extend credit to, bar to borrowers and serve as a source of support. The FDIC continues to monitor developments and is prepared to use all of its authorities as needed. The FDIC is committed to working cooperatively with our counterparts at the other federal regulators, as well as with policymakers in the Congress to better understand what brought these institutions to failure and what measures can be taken to prevent similar failures in the future. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I'd be glad to respond to questions. Thank you. Uh, Under Secretary Lang. Ranking Member Waters. Members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today and for the opportunity to speak several times in recent weeks to share updates from Treasury regarding current events. The American economy relies on a healthy... If you'd pull your mic closer and, or direct it towards you, thank you. The American economy relies on a healthy and diverse banking system, one that includes large, small, and mid-sized banks, 
and provides for the financial needs of families, businesses, and local communities. Nearly three weeks ago, problems emerged at two banks with the potential for immediate and significant impacts on the broader banking system and the economy. The situation demanded a swift response. In the days that followed, the federal government took decisive actions to strengthen public confidence in the U.S. banking system and to protect the American economy. On March 9th, depositors of Silicon Valley Bank withdrew $42 billion in deposits in a period of just a few hours. After concluding that significant deposit withdrawals would continue the next day, the California state regulator closed SVB and appointed the FDIC as receiver. Two days later, the New York financial regulator closed Signature Bank, which also had experienced a depositor run and appointed the FDIC as receiver. Treasury worked to assess the effects of these failures on the broader banking system, consulting regularly with the Federal Reserve and FDIC. On Sunday evening, recognizing the urgency of reducing uncertainty for Monday morning, Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC announced a number of actions to stem uninsured depositor runs and to prevent significant disruptions to households and businesses. First, the boards of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve recommended unanimously, and Secretary Yellen approved after consulting with the President, two actions that would enable the FDIC to complete its resolution of the two banks in a manner that fully protects all of their depositors. These actions ensured that businesses could continue to make payroll and that families could access their funds. Depositors were protected by the Deposit Insurance Fund. Equity holders and bondholders of the banks were not covered. Second, the Federal Reserve created the Bank Term Funding Program, a new facility to provide term funding to all insured depository institutions eligible for primary credit at the discount window based on their holdings of Treasury and agency debt securities. This program, along with the existing pre-existing discount window, has helped banks to meet depositor demands and bolstered liquidity in the banking system. This two-pronged targeted approach was necessary to reassure depositors at all banks and to protect the U.S. banking system and economy. These actions have helped to stabilize deposits throughout the country and provided depositors with confidence that their funds were safe. In addition to these actions, on March 16th, 11 banks deposited $30 billion into First Republic Bank. The actions of these large and mid-sized banks represent a vote of confidence in the banking system and demonstrate the importance of banks of all sizes working to keep our economy strong. Moreover, on March 20th, the deposits in certain assets of Signature Bridge Bank were acquired from the FDIC and on March 26, the deposits in certain assets of Silicon Valley Bridge Bank were acquired from the FDIC. We continue to closely monitor developments across the banking and financial system and coordinate with federal and state regulators. As Secretary Yellen has said, we have used important tools to act quickly to prevent contagion, and they are tools we would use again to ensure that American deposits are safe. Looking forward, while we do not yet have all the details about the failures of the two banks, we do know that the recent developments are very different from those of the global financial crisis. Back then, many financial institutions came under stress because they held low, low credit quality assets. This was not at all the, the catalyst for the recent events. Our financial system is significantly stronger than it was 15 years ago. This is in large part due to the post-crisis reforms for stronger capital and liquidity. As you know, the Federal Reserve announced a review of the failure of SVB and the FDIC a review of Signature Bank. I fully support these reviews and look forward to learning more in order to inform any regulatory and supervisory responses. We must ensure that our bank regulatory policies and supervision 
are appropriate from the risks, old and new, that banks face today. Thank you to the committee for its leadership on these important issues and for inviting me here to testify today. I look forward to your questions. I recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Um, Under Secretary Lang, when did you become aware of the severe financial distress of Silicon Valley Bank? Um, Chairman, Date and Kennedy, time would we, be helpful. We became aware. Um, when did you of, become aware? I'm going I to you. I became aware of issues at Silicon Valley Bank on Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesday or Thursday. I would like to have a written uh, response to when you became aware. You can search your email. That would be helpful. Vice Chair Barr, when did you become aware? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on when did you become aware of the SBB's Sorry. financial distress? Uh, I, I was going to answer that Thursday morning I received uh, an email from staff indicating that Wednesday evening the bank had difficulty. Thursday morning. When did you become aware, Vice uh, Chairman? Um, I believe it was Thursday evening. Staff came in to a meeting I was at. Uh, Thursday the evening so. for Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Along those lines, and you had a staff presentation in February that included Silicon Valley Bank and the distress because of uh, rising interest rates on their portfolio. What did you do between that February staff presentation to you and the week of March 6th about Silicon Valley Bank? Uh, staff uh, presented on the interest rate risk. Of yes, that's what I said. That was a February presentation. What did you do as vice chair of supervision between that time and the bank, uh, the week of the bank failure? Staff indicated that they were completing their review uh, of the bank and of this broader horizontal review at that time, and I was waiting for the results of that review. Did, were you aware of Silicon Valley Bank raising capital the week of March 6th? I, I believe I became aware of that in this email that I described to you. On Thursday morning, morning. that right. they had successfully raised the capital, but they had dis they, were, they were facing financial distress. I, I was not aware um, Thursday morning that there were deposit outflows. I was trying to finish the answer to that question. I was aware of, of the difficulty Wednesday night in raising capital, but the bank was reporting to supervisors Thursday morning that deposits were stable. When did you so, become aware of the deposit flows? At on Thursday. Th Thursday afternoon, late afternoon, I became aware of deposit flows and Thursday evening that there was essentially a bank run. So Thursday afternoon, which could be mid-morning in California? Is that what you're um, suggesting? I, I believe it was around noon in California and for me around 3 o'clock. Okay. On the, on and the did you make provision for the discount window or pledgeable assets at that time you heard of their distress? My, my understanding from the staff is they were in discussions with the bank itself beginning Thursday afternoon to try and move pledgeable collateral over to the discount window. That work continued Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, and actually overnight. Did you make provision to keep the discount window open so they could provision collateral to avoid a bank collapse? The, the discount window um, uh, uh, opening decision is, is sort of like a standard thing. It, it normally closes. A standard thing, except in a moment of crisis. It can be kept open. I think the vice chair for supervision should be able to make that phone call. Did you provision for that? Uh, uh, or did you chairman, think you needed a provision for that? Mr. Chairman, at, at the time, my understanding was that the, the difficulty wasn't sending funds. The difficulty was actually getting the collateral, uh, evaluating the collateral, and getting it pledged to the discount window. And staff were working with Silicon Valley Bank basically all afternoon and evening and, and through the morning the next day to pledge as much collateral as humanly possible to the discount. So on Friday morning, Vice Chair, uh, Chair Grunberg, uh, you were appointed receiver. When did you become aware that FDIC was going to have to take this measure or was going to receive this bank? I think when we were informed Thursday evening. I mean you. Were you yeah, informed I Thursday I was informed evening? Thursday evening by staff. Uh, Which meant you had Friday morning conference calls to make a decision. Was that part I, of it? I, I think we were, I mean, uh, I think we knew Thursday evening that the bank was going to fail and that we needed to make provision to take over the institution. Did you pick um, up the phone and call the vice chair of supervision at the Fed and say, how can we provision to keep this institution open for a Friday? I can't recall that. I, my, my recollection is, Mr. Chairman, that the, the institution was experiencing a liquidity failure and that the it was going to fail 
And it's going to fail on Friday open or Friday evening? Were you provisioning for this for the weekend decision? No, for, no I think the expectation and the and their uh, experience was that the institution was going to be closed in the morning. At what point did you open a, an auction for Silicon Valley Bank? On uh, Friday? I believe it was Sunday afternoon. We just Sunday afternoon, you opened for auction. So that weekend, what happened on, we only heard the announcement of Congress receiving this information at 1120 on Friday morning. There was an idiosyncratic bank. And Sunday afternoon was the next pronouncement from any of you three on the panel, and it was a systemic risk designation. That's what shook the market for the last two weeks. That's the reason why we've had these extraordinary interventions in the financial system. And I want to know the key details of that weekend. I hope we can drill into those, those questions. Sure. With that, I'll uh, recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chair Gruenberg, we know that SVB Bank, nearly half of all U.S. venture, uh, US venture backed startups, potentially tens of thousands of companies, which clearly pose a concentration risk to the bank. While most of the bank's depositors were small and mid sized businesses, they also had large customers too. With the top 10 accounts holding more than $13 billion in combined deposits, Chair Gruenberg and Vice Chair Barr, I'm concerned that depositors' decision to run or stay were not necessarily made on their own, but by the strong encouragement of their venture capital backers who sit on the boards and hold equity in their companies. Were a handful of large venture capital depositors able to influence the withdrawal of $42 billion all at once through their control over their portfolio companies? Congresswoman, I, you know, I think that is something we'll need to look at in terms of the um, uh, post-failure review of these institutions. I couldn't tell you today, um, you know, uh, with certainty uh, uh, what occurred there. I know both the Fed in regard to SVB and we, in regard to Signature, are going to do a careful, careful review of the events that occurred. Thank you very much, and I agree with you. I think we really need to know the role that uh, venture capitals played uh, in this bank. Going further, Vice Chair Barr, you said yesterday that SVB received a three for its management rating, which is considered deficient, but was considered sufficiently capitalized. Given the bank's unique customer base, extremely large share of uninsured deposits, and underwater asset portfolio, liquidity management was also a key issue. The liquidity rating for a bank should account for interest rate risk and the bank's asset liability management. What was the bank's rating on liquidity? Uh, thank you, Representative Waters. Um, my understanding is in the summer of 2022, although the composite rating was a three, that is not well managed, the liquidity rating was a two, which would have been satisfactory. And one of the things we're looking at in the review is how that synced up with the supervisory matters requiring attention and matters requiring immediate attention with respect to liquidity that had previously been issued. So we're looking at whether there those standards were sufficiently stringent, whether the firm should have been downgraded uh, further, and whether further supervisory steps should have been taken. Whose, whose responsibility was it, understanding the deficient rating, uh, to do something? The, the, the Federal Reserve is, is responsible for supervising this institution. Did the Federal Reserve fail on that? I think that any time you have a, a bank failure like this, uh, bank management clearly failed, supervisors failed, and, and our regulatory system failed. So we're looking at all of that. Thank you. Vice Chair Barr, you said yesterday that SVB received a three uh, for its management rating, uh, and uh, you just responded in a way that says, yes, that is true, and perhaps something should have been done, and you're going to look further at that. Uh, are you suggesting perhaps legislation to deal with that? We're focusing in our review on our own supervision, ways that we could have done better as supervisors at the Federal Reserve, and ways that our own regulatory structure uh, might have uh, played a role with respect to the failure of this firm. So we're inward looking. It's a self-assessment, a prudent thing, I think, for us to do. It's what we tell banks to do. It's, it's sort of the first 
thing you have to do to understand risk within your own institution, and, and that's why we're doing it. Chair Barr, I wonder what it would take to receive a three, four, or five from a federal examiner. Well, I know the idea is to keep exam ratings confidential in order to prevent bank runs, but doing so also prevents this committee from understanding how well the Fed and other regulators are doing in rating banks. In the same way that stress testing results are public, are there ways we can make the supervisory process more transparent to promote discipline and accountability? Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Waters. Uh, I think one of the things we're trying to do here today is to provide that accountability, and we'll do that in our report, uh, which we'll do on May 1st. It will include confidential supervisory information. We uh, normally do not uh, provide that information, but given the fact that this bank failed uh, and triggered a systemic risk exception, we are including that information, including exam reports. Thank you very much. Very important issue. Uh, Chair Gruenberg. Silicon Valley Bank was purchased over the weekend by First Citizens Bank and Trust Company. As you know, I wrote to you on March 18 about former SVB's Community Benefits Plan, which was intended to provide $11 billion in small businesses, housing, and community development support to communities in my home state of California and in Massachusetts. I understand that $2 billion in affordable housing and other projects may be lost are delayed in California because of the failure. Will Citizens Bank and Trust <clears throat> continue implementation of the former bank's community benefits plan? The, um, the agreement between the community organizations in Silicon Valley in regard to the community benefits agreement was an agreement between those two parties. Um, First Citizens will now be taking over Silicon Valley. There'll be an opportunity for the community organizations to engage with First Citizens. I know First Citizens has a community benefits agreement with community organizations where it's currently doing business. So there'll be an opportunity for the groups in California to engage with citizens. And I would note Citizens is also subject uh, to supervision under the Community Reinvestment Act. And so we'll be able to evaluate the degree to which Citizens is serving its communities pursuant to CRA. General Lady's time has expired. We'll now recognize the Vice Chair of the Full Committee, Mr. Hill of Arkansas, for five minutes. Thank the Chairman. Thank the Ranking Member for this prompt hearing after uh, these weeks of uh, tumult, and thank the, uh, the panelists for being here as well. Mr. Barr, when were you nominated for your job? I'm, I'm, I apologize. I don't have the date in my head. It was the spring of last year. And do you know when you were confirmed for your job? Yes, I took my post up in July of, this, of last year, July 2022. July of 2022. So between January 20th, 2021 and July of 2022, who was in charge as vice chairman of supervision at the Federal Reserve? There was no vice chairman for supervision during that time period. And so when that happens, uh, what's the Fed's process for delegating that authority to another member of the Board of Governors or a staffer, or how's that work? I apologize. I, I don't know the technical answer to that question. We'll have to get back to you with a written yeah, response. Yeah, if you if you get back to me, because what we're saying uh, to my colleagues here is that from the turn of administration, we did not have a vice chairman of supervision from January 20, 2021 uh, until July of 2022. And that is precisely the time frames, colleagues, when this bank's business strategy went awry and was under this supervisory concern by the San Francisco Fed. So I just want to have that in the record. And when I look at uh, the results of this bank and the, you know, the UBPR, the call report data, and looking at your good testimony about the timeline that you've disclosed, it appears to me that we have a lack of supervisory urgency here. You outline that the trends in 2021 are what triggered concern by the Federal Reserve examiners, and I assume the state of California. We haven't heard from the state of California. We'd like to. Uh, but there was an exam in the summer of 2021, and then there was, it, it took till the fourth quarter of 2021 to tell the bank we had some specific serious concerns so that you met with the board then, not you, but the supervisors. And then the downgrades didn't come and those tough visits didn't come till the summer of 2022. So really 12 months of discussion between the board and 
the state of California and the San Francisco Fed. That doesn't sound like a very urgent supervisory process. What is it? Do you consider that urgent to take a full 12 months in that process? Uh, Mr. Hill, I think you raise an absolutely essential question. It's one of the things we're going to be asking in our review. Obviously, these events occurred before I arrived at the board. I'm going back and looking at what, what steps were taken and not taken. And I think it's a, a completely fair question. Could the supervisors, should the supervisors really, you know, uh, uh, been much more aggressive in the way that they responded to the risks that they saw and they were noting? And we're going we're gonna to look carefully at that. Yeah. I think it's... I, I just was shocked with uh, the business plan, way out of line with peer. You have matters requiring attention, which is a is a very low level, the lowest level editorial comment by a bank regulator. There was no proposal for a board resolution that I saw in your notes. So I look forward to the results of your uh, comments. On this issue of Dodd-Frank versus S-2155, you know, my reading of, of bank law just those things are just almost not important compared to 12 USC 1818 on cease and desist where the FDIC, the primary bank regulator, the state can do whatever they want to a bank that's not operating in a safe and sound manner. Isn't that right, Mr. Barr? The, um, the, the bank regulators have substantial discretion to use uh, those authorities right. when banks are operating in a, an unsafe and unsound manner. I agree and, with that. And I thought Senator Crapo's comment yesterday was very, very important, that in the rule of construction, that final bit of information in S-2155, the bipartisan bill, bicameral bill signed by President Trump, it says nothing in this bill shall be construed to limit the supervisory authorities for safety and soundness in any way. Isn't that what that rule of construction says? Yes, I, I agree with that. I think we have substantial authority under existing law to regulate firms and supervise firms in a way that is appropriate for their risk and size and complexity. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, talking about the resolution process, are you open to a full investigation, not only of the deposit insurance and not only of the supervisory process, but also uh, look carefully at the resolution process itself? Uh, yes, Congressman. And are you going to conduct that yourself, or would you in, uh, work with us on that? Well, we would certainly be prepared to undertake that review and be transparent with you in regard to it. Something I want to see considered, and I argued this back in 2008 as a private citizen and banker, which is in the resolution process to consider non-bank buyers for these assets. Do you agree that's important we should consider that? Yes, it is, Congressman. Thank you. I yield back. We'll now recognize uh, Ms. Velasquez uh, of New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Barr, the rescue of depositors in Silicon Valley Bank demonstrates that regulators think banks like Silicon Valley pose a systemic risk to the system, just like Gypsy do. Mr. Barr, don't you think Category 3 and 4 banks should face the same rules as the mega banks? Thank you very much uh, for that question. We, we are looking at capital and liquidity standards um, for all large banks, including firms 100 billion and above. Uh, I still think a tiering approach makes some sense. It doesn't have to be the same rules for all banks, but we do need stronger rules uh, for firms of this size. Stronger rules on capital and liquidity, I think, are going to be really important. Right. Mr. Barr, in my view, the decision to ensure all depositors was a necessary and correct step. However, I am frustrated that time and time again we fail to regulate them like one, and as a result we find ourselves in situations like the one that we are currently, currently in. Without proper regulations that account for the systemic risk profile of a bank, we are incentivizing bankers to search for yield and inviting moral hazard. Mr. Barr, the sudden and immediate collapse of Silicon Valley Bank demonstrates the vulnerability of banks and the broader system to interest rate rises. Yet, under our current capital rules, most banks are not required to recognize this risk, only GSIPs. Will the Fed <clears throat> rewrite its rule to require all banks to account for interest rate risk? Well, you raise it, an absolutely essential point and, and one that we are very carefully looking at. Uh, we anticipate uh, engaging in a notice and comment rulemaking process on capital rules. 
uh, with appropriate transitions, and that, that is one of the areas that I think would be important for us to consider in that rulemaking process. So do you think that the rules passed on their S-2155 and written by the Trump administration need to be rewritten? We're going to look as part of our review at not only our supervisory uh, issues, but also at the regulatory structure that the Federal Reserve put in place in 2019 and, and see whether the size thresholds we used, the standards we decided to put in place, uh, all of that is on the table. We're reviewing that. We're going to come back and, and provide an assessment of that uh, on May 1st. Thank you. And Mr. Barr, the Fed has been raising interest rates more rapidly than it has in decades in an effort to lower inflation. It appears that many banks were unprepared for this. Can you explain how the Fed's bank supervision staff coordinate with its monetary policy focused staff to ensure that banks are properly prepared for world telegraph shifts in monetary policy? Does the Fed see regulation and supervision as separate from monetary policy? Our, our, the, the whole of the Federal Reserve um, staff uh, communicate very well together. As you noted, the monetary policy decisions uh, were very well telegraphed. The decisions were essential uh, to meet our congressional mandate uh, of uh, price stability uh, and maximum employment. And we need to make sure that we continue to pursue that. We have separate tools that we use, of course, and as I said in, in other contexts, interest rate risk management is a core bread and butter issue in banking. It's not an esoteric issue, an exotic issue, a complicated issue. It's a straightforward issue, and the bank management failed to do that here. Thank you. And during his news conference last week, Chairman Powell said that the FOMC considered a pause in the interest rate increases in light of the recent banking failures, but ultimately unanimously approved the decision to raise rates due to intermediate data on inflation and the strength of the labor market. How will the Fed balance its supervisory role with its monetary policy role as it considers future interest rate increase? We have really all the tools that we need on the macroprudential and microprudential side uh, to assess financial stability uh, and bank safety issues. And as I said, the banking system overall is, is sound and resilient, deposits are safe. Uh, on the monetary policy side, we're going to be looking at incoming data. We're going to be looking at changing, in, uh, changing financial conditions, and we'll really make a judgment on a meeting-by-meeting -meeting basis about that decision. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Sessions for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, I think you see that this committee uh, will work together, has questions, uh, and would wish to hold you accountable, but I must confess to you after hearing the questions that have taken place, I've heard none of you three accept real responsibility for your role in this endeavor. I've heard that you were aware of it the week of. I've heard that uh, notice was given of oversight back in 21, that a frailty was noticed. I've heard us say that uh, we used all of our tools. I've heard you say uh, things like uh, the FDIC will use all of its authorities. But I've not heard any of you three talk about a systematic failure, let the bosses know what's happening. I've heard the use, well, this got staffed, and that got staffed, and staff did this. I think this is a wake-up call to all three of you. I hope it's a wake-up call to your organization that evidently they can see these bread-and-butter failures back in 2021 but evidently nothing realistic ever occurred to avoid what seemingly anybody that's a professional banker could see. I've seen excessive uh, regulatory oversight by this administration across the board. I've seen a lot of 
what I would call inattention by decision makers. So I would specifically tell you that we will drill down on and need to know more about the recommendation for systematic exception that was invoked. In other words, that was invoked by presumptively the people at this table, and yet it took all this time to filter up before you were even aware. Failure occurred, was occurring, and then you were given notice. So I would hope myself that there would be some inward thinking about your actual roles instead of staffing everything and waiting for it to bubble up to you that there should be hooks in place. I spent 16 years in the private sector, ran a large organization, over 700 employees. I had a more than a fiduciary responsibility. I had a managerial responsibility to report up the things that we saw to a very large organization. And I believe, by and large, those people welcomed my feedback and set ourselves up for that. So take uh, the remaining minute and 50 seconds and give me some inward thinking because I heard no one say we were part of the problem. We need to look at us being part of the problem and we need to be a part of the solution because, as was noted, this will be paid by all banks across the country of the FDIC. Please. Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sessions. I, I agree with you. I think we need to take a good, hard look inside at the Federal Reserve, at our supervision, at our regulation. I think we need to be humble about that. Uh, and, and I think we are going to be unflinching in our review about Does that. Does that include so, your role? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm here today to be accountable to you for that purpose. Well, accountable is one thing, but coming back and actually admitting that you were part of the systematic failure is an entirely different process. People say, well, we'll hold accountability, but actually it's banks that are across the country that play by these rules and offer this money are the backstop. And while I don't want to argue against that, I do want to say I believe there's lots of room to say someone should have caught this as early as and done something back in early 22. Chairman? Congressman, I really don't mean to shirk responsibility here. I think we share responsibility. I think bank management had responsibility. I think we as the regulators of the institution had responsibility. I think we're going to conduct reviews to get a, the facts as to what occurred and a measure of internal as well as external accountability. My own sense here in terms of the supervision of these institutions from my perspective is that both agencies, and I would include ourselves, uh, were aware that there were issues at these institutions and uh, trying to address them through the supervisory process. It's also my judgment, I think, and we're going to conduct a review to, to get all the facts here, if I may say. The gentleman can answer the rest for the record. Uh, with that, we'll now recognize Mr. Sherman of California for five minutes. Due to Dodd-Frank, our banking system is strong. Our regulators avoided a crisis by quick action this month. But the solution was not free. Some $22 billion of spe special assessments will be imposed on banks. That will lead to lower rates on certificates of deposit, perhaps a quarter percent, perhaps an eighth of a percent. Whoa. And our entire economy has been hurt. It's been rattled by what happened this month. Our bank regulatory system uh, has uh, some real flaws. It's an undemocratic system in which FASB writes the accounting rules and doesn't even claim to be part of a democratic government. The Federal Reserve Board's um, uh, uh, regional banks, it's not one person, one vote, it's one bank, one vote. The bankers vote on who's on the regional board, and the bankers of my state elected the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, banks get to pick their regulators, state or federal, holding company or no holding company, Fed or OTC. They can use regulatory arbitrage, and every regulatory agency knows that if it gets a reputation of being too tough, the banks can flee and go to one of their regulatory competitors. Our accounting system for banks is absolutely perverse. If you make a Main Street loan, 
you're penalized under the Cecil system. And you will always list that loan on your balance sheet as being worth less than you paid for the note. If you instead go to Wall Street and buy long-term bonds, you are rewarded. If the bond goes up in value, you can sell it or classify it as available for sale and recognize a profit and justify a bonus. If the bond goes down in value, you can hide it by listing it as held for maturity and list it at the original purchase price on your balance sheet even though you know it's worth 20 or 30 percent less. The crypto billionaires fan the flames because they understood that if they can besmirch our banking and dollar system, crypto goes up and they've made tens of billions of dollars. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, could have saved itself in 2022 by hedging its risk or selling its long-term bonds, but they knew that would cut profits and bonuses. They decided to take the risk, and here we are. And of course, our clawback provisions are inadequate. There are $600 billion of unrecognized losses on the balance sheets of American banks. That needs to be juxtaposed with the $2.2 trillion of capital American banks have. So we're overstating the capital of our banking system by perhaps a quarter. Um, Mr. Barr, uh, uh, particularly watched your, your Senate testimony in which you basically said it was bank mismanagement for them to ignore the good advice your people gave them. It is also misregulation to let banks ignore that advice. You are not running a consulting operation. Uh, you are running a regulatory operation who can force banks to follow that advice. Um, and interest rates go up, interest rates go down. Certainly our, the Fed in auditing banks ought to know that, especially when this is not a 100-year event. Interest rates go up, interest rates go down. I mean, 2023 has its peculiarities, but it's particularly ironic. It's the Fed that's raising the interest rates, and then the Fed that's not examining banks to see if they can survive if interest rates go up. Um, uh, the concern we all have is, are there other banks that could go under because they invested in long-term bonds that aren't worth as much as they paid for them? So uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Gunberg and, uh, uh, and perhaps Mr. Barr, are there any banks out there, and roughly how many, that have capital of under 5% if you subtract from their stated capital their unhedged, unrealized losses on long-term uh, debt? Uh, Congressman, that's a fair question and a factual question, if I may. Let us get back to you on that. We'll get the numbers and share them with you very quickly. And please don't give me the names. Uh, Mr. Barr, do you have any other answer? No, sir. Um, Mr. Gunberg, I know that you're going to be giving us a report uh, about possibly expanding uh, uh, FDIC insurance this spring. I look forward to it. And I hope that you would consider $3 million of coverage, but only of non-interest bearing accounts. Uh, because when a bank is used as a utility for a checking account, we need that coverage. If people are making investments, Gentlemen's we ought to be a little bit more expired. careful, and I'll yield back. We'll now go to the subcommittee chair on national security, Mr. Luke Meyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, for more than a year now, financial news has focused on Fed raising rates. There isn't a person in the financial services sector of the country that hasn't heard about it on a seemingly everyday basis since the beginning of 2022. Well, it has been the fastest rate increase in our country's history, which I believe is probably too fast. Chairman Powell has made his intentions very clear. No banks should have been caught off guard by rate increases. In fact, the Federal Reserve is in the same position themselves. Mr. Uh, Powell was here a couple weeks ago and acknowledged that his bond holdings have got them and the interest rates situation that they have is actually losing money as a result of this himself. So. It's even more surprising that $100 billion banks not considering the effect of rate increases is, in fact, according to your testimony, the Fed staff hasn't presented to the Board of Governors with its impacts on, on rising rates until mid-2023, of uh, February 2023, just last month. So are you telling me that every time the Fed raises rates or dropped rates, there is no economic analysis done on the impact on our economy? 
Mr. Lutkemeyer, I was referencing that particular meeting because the staff. No, that's not my question. My question is, does the Fed, before it raises rates or lowers rates, does it have an economic study done by its economists? They've got a, a team of economists there. Do you have an economic analysis done of the impact of that? Mr. Gabarino, would you please move to your right, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, we, we evaluate all the economic conditions. You get a report from your economists. That the Fed, making any interest rate that the Fed, that, did you do, Does the Fed board get a report from their economists saying what the impact of their rates will be on the economy? Yes we, or no? Yes, we get staff forecasts that uh, forecast the expected impact on the economy of, of rate decisions. Okay, how come you made a specific mention that the, of this in your February report? Then is that a, is that a, why did why did you specify that you got the that the uh, rate? Well, that, that's what I was trying to ex explain earlier. I mentioned that because the report specifically called out Silicon okay. Valley Bank. We, we regularly discuss interest rate problems. Okay. Um, interest rate risk is an important part of supervision and Great. a bread and butter issue. Okay. A bank this size, normally uh, you'll have an examiner or two or a team that is in there on a daily basis. Was, was, there, was there an examiner or team of examiners in Silicon Valley Bank uh, on a daily basis? The, the team uh, consisted of about 20 full-time equivalent staff um, at the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank. They were not in Silicon Valley then? I, I don't know precisely the extent of their in-person in meetings versus their remote analytic work. Okay, that's another problem that we have to talk about, having all this, this work off-site whenever they need to be on-site, being able to have access to the daily data. But as a result of this, and I'll follow up on some of the questions that have been asked before, but ask them in a little bit different way. Um, you knew that we had an interest rate risk problem and a liquidity problem. You acknowledge it all the way through from 2021. It's been established this morning. You have examiners in the bank are watching it on a daily basis. And you know that you've had some reports that say we need to take some action. Why was no action requested or not forced on the bank? Uh, there, there was action requested of the bank in the matters requiring attention and matters requiring immediate attention. Why the were they not addressed? Why were they not enforced? I, I think that's a question for a review. We don't know. I don't yet know the answer. Could the staff have escalated more? Should they more? What were the interactions with the bank? That's all part of the supervisory record that will be in the May 1st report. Well, that begs the question then, Mr. Barr, if you think you need more rules and you're not even enforcing the existing ones, why do you need more rules? I don't think we need to look at more rules until we figure out which rules were not being enforced, what messages were not being delivered to the bank to be able to do your job. At that point, then we can take a look and see what we need something else. But for you to make the statement, we need more rules and regulations, how about enforcing the existing ones first? We're going to be looking, as I said, at, at, at our own supervision under the existing framework, ways in which existing okay, rules. Okay, very quickly, I've got one more quick question for you here. This also, this situation points out a very unique situation because of the new social media, the world of instantaneous, instantaneously being able to do some things. I have grave concerns because within a less than a two-day period, $42 billion rolled off the books here, basically as a result of a Twitter little informational thing. It begs the question down the road here, uh, Mr. Barr, uh, it, it opens up the possibility whenever you have a bunch of significantly uh, distressed banks that there could be a, 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 uh, a short sell on some of these things that could be out there. We need to be talking about that. Are you thinking about that at all yet? Yes, I think you're, you're raising absolutely important and critical questions about uh, the role of social media, the role of networks, depositors with each other, uh, and, and the and you're, you're working on a real-time sure. payment system that's going to be Germans. ripe for a problem like this with Twitter. If we don't Gentlemen, think time's so expired. You can Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The record. Uh, we'll go, now go to uh, Mr. Scott of Georgia for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice Chair. We know that this was basically the fault of the management. But what we want to know is where did the Fed go wrong? Where did the Fed go wrong? Um, and specifically, did the Fed miss red flags or ignore warning signs that were brought to you by your staff months or even years before the collapse? Uh, thank you very much for the question. We do have in, in the supervisory record staff 
reaching out to the bank, highlighting these problems. As you noted in the first instance, it's bank management's responsibility to fix those problems. They, they didn't do so. Well, Vice Chair, is it true that the San Francisco Fed, which supervised Silicon Valley Bank, sent multiple warnings to the bank's management about the risk it was taking, including its substantial holdings of treasuries and other bonds that were steadily losing money as the interest rates rose. Yes, this, the supervisors pointed out to the banks that they were exposed to interest rate risk and liquidity risk, and, and that they didn't have the management risk management in place to address those. And, and the how, banks failed to fix those problems. And how often did Fed staff share with the Board of Governors that rising interest rates were threatening the finances of some banks, and in particularly the risk taking at Silicon Valley banks? My understanding is that the particular issue with Silicon Valley Bank did not rise to the level of the board until mid-February of uh, this year. And, and, and the other question is The this. board of governors, I should uh, say. Why do you think that the full extent of the bank's vulnerability did not become apparent until it was too late, especially when the FDIC data was showing that SBB was doubling in size in 20 and 21, doubling in size within 12 months. My, my, was that not a red flag? Well, I, th I think you raised, I, I apologize, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there at no. the end. Uh, I, I think that one, one of the things we're looking at is that the way the Federal Reserve's regulations set up the structure for approach to supervision treated firms uh, in the 50 to 100 billion range with lower levels of requirements and had a phase-in period to, for firms that got above the 100 billion line that meant that their transition into those higher standards took a long time. So by the time a, the, the group was actually looked at in an intense way by the group in the large and foreign banking organizations team, a lot of that growth and a lot of that activity had happened. And so in a sense, it was very late in the process. And that's one of the things we're looking at in our review. Good. And uh, I want you to know that I appreciate your recent announcement that a formal review into whether the Fed failed is good to admit failure. That is the first step for correcting the problem. And whether the Fed failed to properly oversee Silicon Valley Bank will take place, and more importantly, that it will be shared with us in the public. Is that true? Yes, th that's ac absolutely right. We thought that it's really important as a first principle of risk management for us to do our own self-assessment. We have a team of people working on that self-assessment who are not involved in the supervision of Silicon Valley Bank. We're going to make all of those uh, findings uh, and recommendations public uh, on May 1st. And let me also say we welcome other outside reviews as this body is doing today and, and others will as well. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. The gentleman from uh, Michigan, uh, Mr. Heisinger, uh, the chair of the Oversight Subcommittee is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to quickly move uh, ahead here. Um, a loss in confidence in the banking system is a loss of confidence in regulators in many of our uh, minds. Um, and uh, regulators seem to have had the tools at their disposal to prevent these failures from happening. They seem to have missed that. Uh, we're going to be exploring that. As chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, uh, I find it necessary to reiterate how important the congressional oversight is and, and that it's a constitutional authority that we have and, frankly, an obligation that we have 
uh, to maintain the well-being of our system of government. Uh, Mr. Barr, you just had said it was uh, appropriate for outsiders to uh, do their independent reviews. That's what we are trying to do here today. You were authorized, though, on March 13 to do your report, correct? Who, who authorized that? Um, Chair Powell and I made... Okay, that's, that's all I need to know. Chair Powell authorized you? Chair Powell and I jointly made the decision okay. for me to proceed Great. with this. Is it, is it your understanding as well that under Dodd-Frank, anytime 13.3 is invoked and utilized, that the GAO is also supposed to do a report? Um, I, I'm not familiar with that precise provision, but it makes sense to me that GAO should do a review. Okay. Um, and do you know when GAO is going to be starting their report? I, I respect the independence of, of the GAO okay. and suggest Great. that... Uh, page two of your testimony, uh, you said that the mayor report will include confidential supervisory information. Uh, will you be providing that uh, that CSI to uh, the GAO? Yes, consistent with okay. normal practice. Right. Well, we might have to unpack that a little bit. Uh, will you also commit to me and this committee and to the chairman that you will provide this committee with all those same related confidential supervisory information needed to appropriately assess on our end uh, what happened. Yeah, the same information in the May 1st report will be available. No, no, not, not in the report. You're giving the, if you're giving that, that, that supervisory information for the GAO to do their review, not before you review it yourself and decide what is, what is appropriate and not appropriate. You, I thought you just said, that you would be providing GAO with all of that data and information that you will be using to make your report. Is that correct? We will make the information that we are using for the report available to you and to the GAO. And Okay, so we have your commitment that you are going to be providing us with all of that raw confidential uh, supervisory information so that we can do our job. The same information that we'd use for the GAO and for the public report. I'm not looking for the report, though. I want to make sure we've got the information. I'm just trying. I'm trying to make sure that our semantics are being played. I will. Our I will rules. accept the answer that you are going to give us the exact same information in a timely fashion that you are using for your report. Fair. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, the uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Grunberg, I want to uh, uh, touch on uh, on the Treasury's commitment. I'm sorry, the FDIC, um, uh, to, uh, to, to look at what is, uh, was going on there. Um, it, the, uh, the, the same question really is to you. Will you commit to providing the committee with all related uh, confidential supervisory information that is needed for us to assess? Yes, what Congressman. I, one, I think you have the authority to compel that information. We'll be responsive to you. Okay. Uh, timely manner is the uh, is the key watchword here. Uh, we, between myself and uh, the chairman, uh, Chairman McHenry, uh, we have a number of uh, requests to all of you. Um, uh, Ms. Lang, I uh, want to touch on this. Uh, to obtain uh, the information, you, uh, FSOC was convened on both March 10, March 12, and March 24. Has FSOC met since March 24? Uh, they have not met since March. You have not. Okay. Um, so it, it was reported that uh, Secretary Yellen convened these officials via video conference. Is that correct? Yes, I believe there and were, you were part two of that? FSOC meetings. Okay, and you were part of that? I was part of the second one. Um, I was not part of the first one. You were not part of the 10th. Okay. I was not. That was the evening, I believe, we announced. I was not part of the March All right. 12th meeting. Were, were minutes taken at the, those meetings? And by process, by normal process, minutes would have been taken. And will we have access to those minutes? Yes, they are released according Before to they're released, because we only have minutes from December 22. There is nothing that has been released publicly since December 22. That is correct. I believe the process is minutes are released following the next formally scheduled FSOC meeting. Only a formally we scheduled. Can, we can come back to you on that when they will be released. So we have to wait till the next formally scheduled time to get those minutes. I understand that's the expired. process, but we we'll be following up in writing. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we expect a written response for, for that, Undersecretary. 
I will now recognize uh, Mr. Lent. Uh, Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. Uh, I want to follow up on uh, Ms. Waters' line of questioning. Uh, prior to its collapse, Silicon Valley Bank uh, was a major lender and investor in low and income, uh, low and moderate income housing in Massachusetts in my district. Uh, in large part, because it acquired uh, the Boston Private Bank and Trust Company back in 2021. So uh, that includes not only deposits, but, but construction financing, permanent financing, mortgage lending for low and moderate income home buyers, equity investments, and direct purchase of tax exempt bonds for affordable housing development. So right now I've got 18 uh, affordable housing developments in my district and, and on the outskirts of my district, currently in construction in Massachusetts. And they depend on the fulfillment of outstanding debt and equity commitments that were made by Silicon Valley Bank. So these developments, uh, and this is the back of the envelope, I'm sure there are more, but I have 754 homes, including 702 affordable homes for residents with low incomes, and 118 homes for residents with extremely low incomes, as well as workforce housing. So, uh, while the vast majority, here, here's the thing, while the vast majority of high net worth investors uh, and, and depositors at Silicon Valley Bank have been held harmless, they've been rescued, they've been rescued, uh, the First Citizen Assumption Agreement is completely silent on the status of these low-income victims. And that is a problem. That flies in the face of your mission and, and mine. And uh, so, Mr. Gruenberg, uh, now, and I appreciate all three of you and the work. You, you, you worked quickly once you saw the problem. And, and I, I find great fault with the, the reckless management on the part of Silicon Valley Bank in that they concentrated so much risk and there was an absence of meaningful risk management. But we have a problem. And, and while the, the bank crisis might be over, it's not over in my district with all these families, all these low-income families that are, that are struggling. You know, I got cities like Brockton, Massachusetts. Uh, we got a great mayor there doing a wonderful job, and they're really, they're all going in the right direction, and as well as Boston and, and Quincy and others. But uh, we need help. We need to resolve this. So, Mr. Gruenberg, I need a commitment from you, sir. Uh, that we, you, you need to come to Brockton. You need to come to Brockton in my district, and we need to work this through so that we provide the kind of protection for low-income families, a lot of them families of color, many, many first, uh, you know, they're, they're first-generation immigrants, and, uh, you know, they need help. And uh, I think you and I need to, to be there, and I'll get my mayors together and and uh, these 18 affordable housing development uh, managers, and we'll, we'll try to get this done. But can I get your commitment? Any thoughts on that? Congressman, I'd be glad to do that and follow up with you as um, First Citizens takes over, continue, is in a position to continue to serve the customers of the former institution and work with you in regard to the community issues you just described. That's great. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, th there's something new and different, though, in this, this collapse. Uh, you know, there was a concentration of risk on, uh, on the part of Silicon Valley Bank. You know, they catered to, to early-stage startups, that, which have a high rate of failure in the first place. Uh, they're, they're very skittish, so those aren't core uh, deposits that are going to stay through any period of, of uh, you know, unsettled uh, uh, economy. Uh, and then you, on, on top of that, you have... Uh, panic that is driven by social media in many cases. You had, you know, venture capitalist firms telling their clients at that bank to get the heck out. So the speed at which this happened was a matter of hours. And again, I, I, I commend you on the speed at which you acted. But is there something more that we need to be doing now because of the, the velocity of, of money people can move their money out like that, and, and are we equipped? The FDIC has a long and strong history, but is, 
is something new and different needed to protect us from that phenomenon? And Congressman, I think that's an important question to ask. I think we are dealing with, um, with a different environment, and the points you raise in terms of how quickly money can move, how, what the technology enables now that exceeds what's occurred in the past is a new risk factor that we have to think about. I would ask the panel to all respond to the gentleman in written form about that very, very important subject. Thank I will you. now uh, recognize uh, Ms. We Ms. Wagner of Missouri for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, Vice Chair Brower, we're going to go very quickly here, so I would like some succinct uh, brief answers, if we could. Vice Chair Barr, referring specifically to Federal Reserve supervisors, do you know how many citations, specifically the matters requiring attention, MRAs, and matters re requiring immediate attention, MRIAs, that were issued to Silicon Valley Bank regarding its, its management of liquidity risk? Microphone. Microphone and a number. Do you know how many? Um, in November 2021, there were six MRAs and MRIs on liquidity. Uh, in the summer of 2020, sorry, in the fall of 2022, there was an additional MRA on interest rate risk modeling. I think I misidentified inadvertently yesterday as an MRIA, but as an MRA. That's fine. I don't need you to go through all of them. We've got six, maybe seven of, of these citations that were given. Yesterday, you were asked about an MRIA that was issued in the fall of 2022. You stated that the MRIA was issued, quote, based on the inaccuracies of their interest rate risk modeling. Essentially, the risk model was not aligned with reality. This is your quote. Yes. Did the supervisors provide the bank a timeline to remediate this misalignment? Since changing an interest rate risk assessment model seems to be something that could be done very quickly. Yes, my understanding uh, that, that there were time limits associated with each of these MRAs and MRAs, but I don't have the information. Really? Okay. Well, clearly time. those alerts were ignored at the bank. Why didn't the Fed consider escalating any of these issues into a cease and desist order or other formal enforcement action against the bank to require senior management and the board of directors to remediate these serious deficiencies? I think you raise a fair point, and we will be looking into that. I certainly hope so. Vice Chair Barr, in your testimony, you stated, quote, the failure of SVB illustrates the need to move forward with our work to improve the resilience of the banking system. For example, it is critical that we propose and implement the Basel III endgame reforms, which will better reflect trading and operational risks in our measure of banks' capital requirement needs. Sir? I strongly disagree. These reforms will result in additional costs on consumers, on businesses, and investors. I'm going to go real quickly here. Was trading risk the reason SVB had almost 94% of its deposits uninsured? No. Was trading risk the reason SVB did not have a risk officer for nearly nine months last year? I, I do not believe that that was the focus of why there was not a, a credit so, risk officer. So, no, trading risk was not the reason. Was trading risk the reason SVB had 51 percent of its deposits in the tech industry? Yes or not, no? Not to my knowledge. You know, I fail to see how SVB illustrates a need to implement Basel endgame reforms, particularly as it relates to trading risks. Can you show how trading risk directly resulted in SVB failure? Or, sir, are you just looking for any reason, uh, correlated or not, to justify increasing capital requirements for our banks? I, I think it's really quite important that we strengthen capital and liquidity requirements in the system. It's something I've been working on since arriving at the board in July. And I think that the work that we're going to do, uh, that we will propose through notice and comment rulemaking, will make the financial system safer and sounder. That reduced risk that firms uh, such as SVB and the You future stated that, that yesterday that our banks are well capitalized, did you not? Yes, I, I have been consisting in saying that both that the system is strong, uh, but that also we need to think about stronger capital rules, and I think that's appropriate given the Well, we're going to have a, a, a hearty 
give and take on this. You know, I, I want to say this in closing. Despite U.S. regulators having clear knowledge of insufficient risk management, it seems that the examiners and your supervisors were asleep at the wheel, while signs that Vil Silicon Valley Bank was heading towards a collapse were staring them right in the face for many, many months. Vice Chair Barr, I look forward to the release of your view um, of the supervision and regulations of Silicon Valley Bank so we can dig in some more on May 1st, and I hope that it provides more clarity to the events leading up to these bank failures. I thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. We'll now recognize Mr. Green of Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member, the witnesses for appearing. Um, witnesses, you have all made the case for mismanagement at Silicon Valley. If you uh, disagree with this statement, uh, please extend a hand into the air. Let the record reflect that all witnesses agree that mismanagement was occurring. I have uh, before me a news article from what is perceived to be by many a reliable source, CNBC. The style of the article is, that would be the title, the style is Silicon Valley Bank employees receive bonuses hours before government takeover. Hours before government takeover bonuses. It's also alleged by other sources that these bonuses could exceed $100,000. Mr. Gruenberg, is it true that hours before the takeover of the bank, before it was seized, that bonuses were accorded employees? Uh, Congressman, since we weren't the supervisor, I wouldn't have that direct information. I'm sure we could get it for you or the Federal Reserve could provide it. I, I welcome the intelligence from the Federal Reserve. But if I could just make an additional point, which is um, the FDIC is under a legal obligation after the failure of Silicon Valley uh, to conduct an investigation of the conduct of the board and the management of the institution. And if misconduct occurred, we do have authority uh, to impose civil penalties, including civil mon monetary penalties, restitution, and to bar individuals from the business of banking. Thank so you. We do have some significant authorities Thank and you. responsibilities. Thank you. Uh, I yield to the FDIC. Excuse me, to the, uh, the Fed. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Green. Uh, the board also has the authority. Uh, uh, without the authority right now, just tell me, did the bonuses, were there bonuses given out hours before the bank was seized. I, I have seen reporting of that, but I'm still trying to chase down the facts. You, Our enforcement team has the ability to uh, go after actions against individuals. So you're saying you, you do not know, but you have heard that this is the case? Yes, I do not have the supervisory record of that uh, to know, but I've seen reporting of that, and All we're right. looking into it. For the moment, uh, let's just assume that Bank X hands out bonuses management has failed to do its job, do you have the inherent or accorded or statutory power to claw back those bonuses? We have the, we have the ability to pursue actions for individuals who violated the law. May, may I kindly ask about clawback of bonuses? Can you claw back those bonuses? Uh, under our authority, if there are violations of the law or unsafe or unsound practices or any breach of fiduciary duty, we can get restitution, uh, we can get civil money penalties, and so we can have a should I assume that your answer is no, you do not have the authority to claw back those bonuses? We, we don't have generalized clawback authority. You do not? 
All right, I see a hand raised. Uh, Mr. Gruenberg, uh, please. Just, just to try to respond directly to the question, we do not have explicit claw, the FDIC does not have explicit clawback authority under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act. We have that authority under the Dodd-Frank Act in regard to um, failures under Title II, but we do not have that under the Federal Deposit Insurance mm -hmm. Act. So in considering additional authorities that Congress might provide, that might be something worth considering. Thank you, Mr. Grunberg, because that's exactly where I'm going. Uh, we live in a world where it's not enough for things to be right. They must also look right. And it, it just doesn't look right for hours before the bank is seized bonuses to be accorded employees, and some of these bonuses total more than $100,000. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now Thank recognize you. the uh, Chair of the Financial Institution Subcommittee, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for holding this important hearing. And Vice Chairman Barr, true or false, Silicon Valley Bank experienced rapid asset growth in a short period of time. Yes, that's correct. Silicon Valley's rapid growth was fueled by an extremely high concentration of deposits from a single sector. Yes, that's correct. Silicon Valley Bank became over-dependent on an extremely high percentage of uninsured deposits. Uh, yes, that's correct. Silicon Valley Bank failed to hedge the risk of holding long-duration securities in a rising interest rate environment. My understanding is at one point they had hedges and uh, those, are, those were not in place at the time they failed. And that was apparent to the Fed? Yes, it was um, apparent to the Federal Reserve. Silicon Valley Bank had no chief risk officer for eight months before its collapse. Yes, that is correct. Was the San Francisco Fed unaware of any of these basic facts in the months leading up to its failure on March 9th? Uh, not to my knowledge. So nothing in the existing regulatory framework concealed these basic facts from the San Francisco Fed, which had responsibility of supervising this bank? The, the regulatory structure doesn't conceal facts. It, it may have an effect on how supervisors act with respect to those facts. True or false, Silicon Valley Bank was subject to enhanced prudential standards under Dodd-Frank as amended by the 2018 bipartisan regulatory relief law. The, the, um, the Federal Reserve supervisory structure um, did not apply most enhanced prudential standards to the firm. It did have some uh, enhanced prudential standards. Once it became subject um, to, to those standards, after it, it passed the well, let's let's take let, at the but let's level. before it passed that two hundred billion dollar threshold. When it when it passed the one hundred billion dollar threshold, it was under twenty one fifty five the bipartisan regulatory relief law, under section four hundred one a one c of that law. The Fed could have applied enhanced prudential standards to Silicon Valley Bank. Is that correct? Under the 2019 rules that the Federal Reserve put in place, most enhanced prudential standards did not apply to the firm. Well, wait a minute. I, I, I don't know about that because under 401A1C of that law, uh, the Fed, by order or rule, could apply enhanced prudential standards to banks not above $200 billion, but above $100 billion and assets on a one-off basis. Yes, the legislation provided the Federal Reserve with ample discretion. The way that discretion was implemented in 2019 was with a rule, and that rule provided... But in order, but by order, and reclaiming my time, Vice, Vice Chair, by order, the Fed could have applied enhanced prudential standards before the bank reached the size it did by, by February of 2023. My point is, it doesn't seem appropriate to change the tailoring rules for all banks to account for a lapse in supervision by the Fed and the inability of the Fed to deploy enhanced prudential standards to firms when it's currently able to do so under existing law. And, and Mr. Barr, as you and I have discussed and as we agree, we need to preserve the, the diversity of the financial ecosystem here. Uh, the Fed had all the existing tools it needed to supervise this bank and apply those enhanced prudential standards. I, I think pushing uh, uh, a one-size-fits-all or reimposing a one-size-fits-all regulatory regime on community and regional banks, especially regional banks under distress right now, would result in fewer of those institutions, more consolidation, and less competition for too-big-to-fail banks. Uh, Mr. Uh, Director Gruenberg, the vast majority of community banks in my district are well-managed, and they actually understand how to manage interest rate risk in a rising interest rate environment. 
Um, and since the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, those Kentucky banks and their customers have been asking me why they should have to pay an assessment for your rescue of Silicon Valley Bank with 100% guarantee of deposits of largely wealthy, sophisticated depositors at Silicon Valley Bank, some of whom apparently cared more about the bank's commitment to environmental sustainability than their capability to be good stewards of their deposits. I think this is a legitimate question. And I also think it's a good question whether invoking the systemic risk exception to the least cost resolution mandate under the Act was in fact the least cost solution. After all, your decision to cover all of the uninsured deposits costs the deposit insurance fund an estimated $20 billion. Will you commit to using your authority under 12 U.S.C. 1817 uh, to uh, establish separate risk-based assessment systems for large and small members of the deposit insurance fund so that these well-managed banks don't have to bail out Silicon Valley Bank? Um, certainly willing to consider that, Congressman. And as I indicated, we are going to be preparing a comprehensive review of the deposit insurance system. So we'll come back to you and glad to engage with you. Time's Thank you, Ayo. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Himes of Connecticut for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's interesting to me to listen to my friends on the other side of the aisle who ordinarily spend all of their time trying to defund, destroy, and uh, denigrate your organizations now hold you entirely responsible uh, for where we find ourselves today despite uh, despite uh, activities within the bank that I think we all agree, and Mr. Barr, you have said we're, we're uh, on the verge of outrageous. So I'd like to begin by thanking all of you and your organizations for the intense and sleepless actions you took beginning on March 9th. I don't know if you acted perfectly and you don't know if you acted perfectly, but we all know that today the financial system appears to be stabilized. And we certainly know that Congress is not lighting itself on fire, crafting a massive publicly funded bailout as it was in the fall of 2008. I hope that we've dispensed with the absurdity that it was Silicon Valley's woke activities that drove this failure. And while I don't necessarily agree, Mr. Barr, with your predecessor statement that blaming the bipartisan 2018 reform law is so nonsensical it isn't even wrong, the truth is that Silicon Valley Bank was crawling with supervisors and regulators who had been raising the alarm for a long time. And that's what's interesting to me about this whole episode. It was not a surprise. It wasn't a surprise to the regulators and supervisors who had been raising those alarms for years. It shouldn't have been a surprise to the management team who had been the target of those alarms. By the way, just as a side note, it was a surprise to the Wall Street research analysts who were paid very good money to evaluate Silicon Valley Bank. 24 Wall Street analysts cover Silicon Valley Bank. 11 had buy ratings on it, 11 had hold ratings on it. Only one analyst rated it a sell. More seriously, the credit rating agency, S&P Global, rated Silicon Valley investment grade right up until March 10th when it announced that it expected a bankruptcy. There's an uncomfortable echo of 2008. By the way, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to insert for the record unanimous consent a remarkable article by uh, Professor Raj Gopal of the Columbia Business School, which elaborates many of these points that I'm making without objection. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, the facts have been put out there pretty comprehensively. In 2021, three years, uh, two years ago, um, the Fed review results in the finding of serious weaknesses, the issuance of six matters requiring attention and, so, and one matter requiring immediate attention. July of 2022, the full supervision review rates the bank deficient. That's seven to eight months before March's meltdown, early 2023, there's a horizontal review. Again, the word deficient. So, um, and, 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 and by the way, that's, that's complicated for most people to understand. Here's something that's not complicated for people to understand. As far as I can tell, Silicon Valley Bank had precisely one individual who was a banker on their board, Mr. Thomas King. The risk committee of this bank, which tripled in size in two years, had no one the risk committee had no one on the committee with any significant banking experience. So, Mr. Barr, I'm going to put you in an uncomfortable position and say, clearly what we have here is a gap of time and a failure of action between the deficiency rating in uh, July of 2022 and the meltdown in March. That's a long period of time. 
So I'm going to ask you for ideas, not necessarily good ideas. I understand that you're going to be uncomfortable to make recommendations, but clearly we need to tighten up the process by which good things happen after a finding of deficiency. So should that be left in your regulator's discretion, or should we act in such a way as to make actions mandatory subsequent to a deficiency rating? It's a, a great question you raise, and, and one that, that I think um, is appropriate for reviewing uh, both by you and, and by us. I think that we need to put in place risk mit mitigants uh, and incentives that are much stronger, faster in the supervisory process. That's one of the things that we'll be looking at in the review. Uh, but I do think that uh, in instances like this where it is such a fundamental uh, issue, we need to have risk mitigants in place uh, that are ordered by the supervisors quickly. So uh, I'm just going to make this observation as I run out of time. Um, as we all saw, one of the problems here and one of the new things here were the chat rooms and the speed by which deposits could be withdrawn. And billions of dollars went out the door because of these devices. So I'm not convinced that giving humans who operate in human time additional authority is going to do the trick here. I think we need to think about automatic mechanisms, and that may require statutory change, automatic mechanisms that when a finding of deficiency or other adverse observations have been made, kick in automatically, perhaps after some cure period. But, but this was a meltdown that happened at the speed of light, and humans with discretion is not going to solve it in the future. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, what you've heard today. But when I talk to community banks in my district, and in full disclosure, I'm a car dealer, and uh, I talk to them a lot, and I owe them a lot of money, one of their top worries right now is being left to foot the bill for the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Community banks, uh, which most of us live by, should not be liable to pay for the rescue of larger banks that gambled and made a risky bet. So community banks are relied upon Main Street, America, to be a lifeline and provide crucial banking services to small businesses. So these smaller banks, of which we all uh, need to have, are some of the most trusted institutions in the financial industry. So Mr. Gruenberg, you talked about it before, but could you elaborate if smaller community banks in Texas, where I'm from, will be left responsible for bailing out the failed banks in uh, California and New York, which we don't even know where they are? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I, I'm keenly sensitive to the concern. Let me just say, under the law, um, the FDIC is required to impose a special assessment on the banking industry to recover any cost to the deposit insurance fund from covering these uninsured deposits. And we have to do that by a notice and, com and, 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 uh, notice and comment public rulemaking, which we're going to do in May. And just to be clear, the law gives the FDIC authority to consider the types of entities that benefit from any action taken or assistance provided, so that the FDIC does have discretion. And let me just say, without forecasting what our board is going to vote, we're going to be keenly sensitive to the impact on community banks. Take a look at it, because we all know that what they'll do is pass the cost on to someone like me. Uh, the Federal Reserve was supposed to be the primary supervisor over Silicon Valley Bank, but from all we've seen and heard today, they failed to do their job, and it's been reported that Silicon Valley's bank risk practices were on the Federal Reserve's radar. We've talked about that for over a year. In 2022 alone, Federal supervisor, Fed supervisors, issued three findings on SFB's ineffective board oversight, weakness in their risk management, and flaws with the bank's internal audit function. So it should raise major concerns that the Federal Reserve, who is tasked with regulating and overseeing banks, knew about Silicon Valley's risky practices far more than a year and failed to take any corrective action. Now, Mr. Barr, what actions, if any, did the Federal Reserve take, and you talked a little bit about this, after issuing those risk findings, and how did the Fed Reserve become so complacent it's uh, on its supervisor role and miss these warning signs. And I think that that's what people across America really want to know. Uh, thank you very much for the question. My understanding is that the supervisors identified the issues. They brought them to management's attention. The, the response clearly was not an effective response. Bank managers failed to, super, failed to uh, manage the firm in an appropriate way. They didn't manage their interest rate risk and their liquidity risk well, even though it was pointed out by the regulators. And I do think it calls for a, a heightened need for more um, aggressive supervisory action to take care of these problems. But you all missed it, too. 
I'm sorry? You missed it, too. The, the supervisor staff were aware of the underlying issues. I think all of us were uh, caught uh, incredibly off guard by the massive bank run that occurred uh, when it did on, on March 9th and 10th, the scale and speed of that, $42 billion going out the door Thursday afternoon. It, it was expected by the bank that $100 billion more would go out the next day. That's just an extraordinary scale and speed of, of a run that not, not anything I had ever seen before. Okay. Uh, out of all the banking supervisors, I would expect the Federal Reserve and most of us would to be the most aware of the impacts increased uh, with, in, with, with rate hikes would have on the value of securities for banks. However, the Fed uh, has stress tests, which we've talked about, which are conducted to determine how large domestic banks would perform under hypothetical and stable economic scenarios, currently does not test for the problems that caused Silicon Valley Bank to fail. SFB failed because of inflation, rapid increases in interest rates, and the loss in value of government bonds. So even if SFB had been subject to testing, it would not have led to the changes that could have prevented their failure because the Federal Reserve is asking the wrong questions not running scenarios that ultimately led to SFB's downfall. So, Will Crick, Mr. Barr, uh, how can the American people trust the Federal Reserve if you are not testing for all scenarios? How was the Federal Reserve so far off? That, that is a question that everyone asks again. I, I think that the Federal Reserve should uh, use multiple scenarios. That's one of the reasons why I proposed that for this year's test. It includes a rising interest rate environment for the trading book. I think multiple scenarios makes a ton of sense and should be done. You know, that saying, they, they, got, they, got, they can get it right a hundred times. You've got to get it right once. So you got one crack at it. So thank you very much. Someone's time has expired. We're now recognize the ranking member of the Digital Assets Subcommittee, Mr. Foster, Illinois, for five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, as you know, uh, 12 years ago during Dodd-Frank, a number of us put a lot of effort into specifically authorizing U.S. bank regulators to put contingent capital requirements into the capital stank, stack of large banks. Uh, these can sort of be thought of as a sort of privately funded uh, insurance policies that large banks are forced to carry that pays out if a bank gets into trouble and automatically injects capital into a struggling but not yet failed bank. Now, for the last 12 years, U.S. bank regulators have completely ignored this authorization from Congress, which I have complained about in number, numerous hearings. But in the last 12 years, European bank re regulators and others have used contingent capital successfully. And so now I believe that we have a lot to learn about two side-by-side -side bank failures. First, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, a large bank by some measure, but with total assets less than 1% of U.S. GDP and Credit Suisse with total assets greater than 100% of Swiss GDP, too big to fail by any metric. Now, when a couple of weekends back, the U.S. banking regulators tried to find someone to buy Silk SVB, they failed. The result was potential systemic risk and emergency intervention that has, uh, by regulators, that's risked abandonment of a lot of market discipline and market chaos. And the, de the deposit insurance fund and eventually banks and their customers must take the hit. But when Swiss regulators tried to find a partner to buy out Credit Suisse, they succeeded. And at this point, it looks likely that the Swiss taxpayer and their diff will be off the hook for this giant bank's failure. And the difference was contingent capital. Because when Credit Suisse got into serious trouble, their contingent capital triggered and injected $17 billion of equity into Credit Suisse. This was absolutely essential to finding a buyer for Credit Suisse, since, as you know, Credit Suisse was bought by about, for about $3 billion, but only after the $17 billion of capital injection by their contingent capital instruments. So the Swiss contingent capital succeeded at its two design objectives. First, to prevent contagion, and secondly, to keep the Swiss taxpayer off the hook for the failure of a truly giant bank. Now, if Silicon Valley Bank had been forced to carry an appropriate amount of contingent capital, then capital would have been automatically injected sometime probably Friday at the latest. And it, it was very likely that a buyer could have been found over the weekend as well. And we would not be having this hearing today. In fact, it's possible that they would not have gotten in trouble in the first place since uh, Silicon Valley Bank would have had to answer not only to the regulators, but to the bond markets for their risky practices. 
when they went through their gigantic growth spurt, they would have had to issue a lot of contingent capital instruments. And I'm pretty confident that one of the wizards in the bond market would have said, hmm, this is interesting. This bank is, you know, has uh, very flighty deposits and essentially no risk management in place. Maybe we should charge a pretty big risk premium and the markets may, might have detected that. So my question is this, Vice Chair Barr, as part of your holistic review of bank capital requirements, will you commit to finally seriously considering contingent capital requirements in the capital stacks of large banks? Thank you very much for your question, and I, I very much appreciated our conversations over the years on, on this very question of contingent capital instruments. Uh, both the FDIC and we have issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking of a different type of contingent instrument, a gone concern capital instrument that would be required for large uh, banks. But I think it does make sense to consider alternative options, and I'd be happy to continue the conversations with you about that. Okay, and I would specifically appreciate it if your analysis included a counterfactual analysis of how much better off we would have been if regulators had listened to Congress and included contingent capital requirements into the capital stacks of these banks. Because I think there's a lot to be learned from just the counterfactual analysis. Uh, I'd like to just uh, close out by uh, finishing up a little bit of, of with questions about uh, the non-responsiveness of, of SVB management uh, to the early warnings they got. Um, is there leverage that we can provide you? You know, an obvious one is to say these all of these uh, these matters requiring immediate attention and so on are private. And what, for example, if they had to become public after 60 days, if they were not resolved, would that have lit a fire under the, the chair of the, of the management? Um, are there other things? For example, you could say any management that had an ongoing, um, a, a pending uh, MR matters requiring immediate attention, we would simply put all the bonuses in escrow. Uh, that would I'm almost certainly get their attention. So are there... If you could you know, time these sort of expired. ideas, I'd appreciate it. Uh, if, if you'd submit, uh, for the record, Mr. Grimberg, Mr. Barr. Um, now recognize Mr. Emmer of Minnesota for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman McHenry. Uh, thanks for holding this important hearing today. The collapse of three regional banks over the course of two weeks is directly related to failed Democrat policies. Record inflation as a result of reckless government spending led to historic interest rates that banks were not ready to manage. It appears financial regulators were not appropriately communicating financial risks of the high-rate economy with banks in their supervisory capacity, and this administration's political attack, quite frankly, from the highest levels of our government on the digital asset industry, which, by the way, had nothing to do with causing the runs, sparked fear leading to bank runs at Silvergate, Silicon Valley Bank, I, in apparently signature, bringing these core issues plaguing our economy and the broader banking sector to the surface. Let's not be fooled. Providing financial services to legal businesses in the U.S. should not be risky. But this past month has proven that the mismanagement of our monetary policy has apparently made it risky to put dollars in a bank. Mr. Uh, Grunberg, will the FDIC sell off signatures deposits from uh, digital asset businesses? Yes or no? Uh, we're returning those deposits to the depositors, Congressman. So, okay. Uh, does the FDIC plan to sell the intellectual property for Signet? I believe that's already been sold out of the um, Bridge Institution, Congressman. All right. We would like to uh, see that uh, information. Uh, will you commit that a bank that buys Signet will be able to use it to facilitate 24-7 access to the banking system for digital asset companies? I'm, I'm happy to look into that. I don't know who the buyer was, but be glad to look into it and, and follow up with you in regard. You're not going to block uh, the buyer from uh, doing 24 7 uh, banking for digital asset companies, is that correct? I, if that's the nature of the acquisition, yes. And will you commit that a bank that buys Signet, or the bank that did, will be able to, uh, to uh, onboard new digital asset customers? Again, I'd, I'd like to look into the transaction, but I'd be glad to follow up with you in regard to it. When the FDIC sold off Silicon Valley's bank, uh, Valley Bank's deposits to First Citizens, did that include deposits from any digital asset firms or VCs in the digital asset space? I believe uh, all of the deposits from uh, the failed Silicon Valley Bank were transferred 
to first citizens in including the digital all of them yes were all of uh, SVB's deposits from digital asset businesses I, I, again transferred to citizens that's yes, what you're saying my understanding first citizens assumed all the deposits of the failure. has the FDIC ever communicated implicitly or explicitly sir to any banks that their supervision will be more onerous in any way if they take on new or maintain existing digital asset clients no Thank you. The FDIC estimates estimates uh, that resolving estimates that resolving Signature Bank is going to lead to a 2.5 billion dollar loss to the deposit insurance fund, and resolving Silicon Valley will lead to a 20 billion dollar loss to the deposit insurance fund. When the FDIC sold Signature, it had the effect of closing Signet, which is an innovative payment system that facilitated 24/7 access to banking services. Uh, frankly, a private sector innovation uh, that apparently will be rivaled by FedNow. Uh, Signet is intellectual property that has significant value, so I do want to see that uh, sale. Chairman Grunberg, when managing the resolution of any failed bank, the FDIC is statutorily required to do so using the least costly resolution option, thereby minimizing losses to the deposit insurance fund, which is replenished by the banks through fees that are indirectly passed on to everyday Americans with bank accounts. I'm concerned that the FDIC has deviated from its statutory requirement to minimize costs here and has instead has opted to pursue a lazy and destructive regulatory campaign to in fact oust digital asset opportunities from the United States. No bank is designed to survive manufactured bank runs and in analyzing what caused this fiasco in the first place, many signs point right back to you and the FDIC, this administration, and certain reckless Democrat senators. I want to thank you again for coming today, and I appreciate a response to my March 15th letter, uh, because to me it's still clear that we have a lot of questions uh, that need answers. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Uh the ranking member of the National Security Subcommittee, Mrs. Beatty, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking uh, Chair. Mr. Grunberg, we know that both SVB and Signature had very high proportions of uninsured deposits, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent. Can you share with us or explain to us what the typical ratio is for your average bank and how this factor played into the bank run that we witnessed on March 9th. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. It's an important question. I think fair to say these two institutions were outliers in terms of their um, ex exceptional concentration of uninsured deposits, both around 90 percent. In the regional bank space between 100 and 5 or 600 billion, I think it's generally in the 40 percent category. So these two institutions were outliers, and it was a significant part of the liquidity risk on their balance sheets. And, and would you say that this high proportion um, of uninsured deposits left the bank more susceptible to uh, this run? Yes, it was, I think. Uh, let me uh, also have a, a follow-up question to you. We've heard many ideas proposed about modifying the $250,000, and we know in, I think it was 2008, with the Emergency Economic Stabilization uh, Act, we went from 100000 to 250000 So, for example, what about temporarily uh, ensuring all deposits, increasing a limit to 500,000 or a million, ensuring all deposits for small and mid-sized firms or limiting it for the largest financial institutions? What are your thoughts on some of these proposals? Well, as, as you understand, Congresswoman, the, the um, uh, coverage for deposit insurance is statutorily set at $250,000 per account. So to adjust it would require legislative change. And as I indicated earlier, the FDIC is undertaking a comprehensive review of our deposit insurance system and will come back uh, with a report that we'll release publicly um, uh, outlining policy considerations for. So is this uh, one of them? And you can weigh in also, Mr. Barr or Ms. Uh, Lang, on, I mean, you're experts, you're testifying here on your opinion. I understand that it's statuary, 
uh, and requires it to come back here. And certainly, as you know, we've changed many things over the uh, years in rooms like this. Uh, so to the public, I don't want you to think that this may be as far-fetched. Uh, we had large banks when we had uh, too big to fail. And we're certainly more than $50 billion now as we uh, had legislative ways to change it. So what are your thoughts uh, on precinct? That's one of the number one things I'm getting from constituents. You know, it, it was just in 2008, it was 100,000. We made the change then through an emergency act. Uh, what now? Congresswoman, um, I look forward. The FDIC, as uh, Chairman Gruenberg mentioned, is doing a review of the deposit. Would you support bill. an increase? I would support a study and, and proposals for reform if needed. The rise in uninsured deposits, it has been increasing over the years. Okay, uh, only because my time is running out. Mr. Barr, and the next question is going to be for you, so. We'd be happy to work with you on thinking through that. I, I think taking a step back, the important thing is that our, our banking system is sound and resilient. Okay. The actions the regulators took demonstrate that deposits are safe, and we'd love to uh, continue the conversation. With you. Okay, I'm glad you said sound and resilient. Uh, in your opening testimony, you said the same thing, that you thought banking was sound. Uh, you also uh, used words like strengthening the public confidence. Um, or paraphrasing uh, it. Um, I'm from Ohio, and the public pension fund nationwide, as you know, lost millions of dollars that were invested in SVB and Signature. In my home state of Ohio, the state teacher's retirement system took the, the biggest hit with some $27 uh, million that was invested in SVP. Uh, representing, I know, maybe only 3 or 4% of the fund's total portfolio. But I'm concerned about reports that the CEO of SVB unloaded millions of stock in the days and weeks leading to the collapse. I know that we're expecting to, uh, a report on the Fed's investigation of SVB in May, but is there anything you can share today regarding uh, the bank's executive management? And, okay, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the panel would respond in writing to Mrs. Beatty. Uh, we'll now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing. Uh, and Chairman Grunberg, I'd like to discuss, and I know my colleague, uh, Congressman Williams, Chairman of the Small Business Committee, as focused on this for, but I'd like to discuss the special assessment fee that will be used to cover the losses from the uninsured deposits. You've explained that proposed rulemaking for the special assessment will occur in May of this year. And while you're thinking about that, be thinking about a discussion of the flexibility that FDIC has during the rulemaking to ensure that our small community banks don't disproportionately carry the burden. Uh, being one of the older members of this committee, I've been around long enough to have observed firsthand several banking crises. 1982, I was uh, getting ready for my final semester at Oklahoma State when a little institution in Oklahoma City called Penn Square went down and took First Continental Illinois of Chicago down with it, a bank from the, what, 1840s or 50s, took First Seattle down with it with them too. Now, FDIC and the regulators responded in the appropriate fashion and addressed that. But it was a combination of a collapse in the oil and gas industry and in production agriculture. And the chain reaction in my great state was the slaughter of community banks. The slaughter. There was no quarter given to those folks. They were locked up, chopped up, sold out, the legislature met in the middle of the night to authorize not just one town, one physical location, one charter banking, but we went to branch banking because it was all falling down on us. The people who I represent were brand new young banking men and women 40 years ago when they saw how community banks were handled in my state. They weren't Penn Square. They weren't First Continental, they weren't C-first. 
they're now my most senior bankers 40 years later. And they're looking at this situation and they're saying to me, we've been the least problematic of any sector in the financial services industry for decades to the regulators and the FDIC. But yet, in every crisis since then, uh, we've been kind of the orphans. And this time they're saying, we were wiped out as an industry 40 years ago, but now we're going to get a special assessment to pay the fund for the mistakes of the most sophisticated institutions, the biggest institutions. Can you tell me how it's possible when this special assessment fee process is completed that my community bankers aren't going to wind up disproportionately paying for the mistakes and the faulty all of the biggest institutions in the country? Uh, or are they just be prepared to be the GOAT one more time? I, critically important question, Congressman, keenly sensitive to it. We have discretion under the law. We have to act pursuant to a notice and comment rulemaking. Anything we put out will be subject to public comment. But we have discretion, as I indicated earlier, and, and will repeat, we'll be keenly sensitive to the impact on community. I don't want to front run my board. We're going to have to do a notice and comment rulemaking. But, but I hear you and keenly sensitive to the point you raised. I would just offer once again the observation, the perspective of my community bankers is, if you're big enough, we've now given you an emphatic protection. It appears with what we've done in the last few months, if you're in that intermediate range, we're going to protect you. But if you're the little bankers, the little guys and ladies out there meeting the day-to-day -day capital needs, you're going to be the one to pick up the bill. And I kind of appreciate their point, having lived through 40 years of these experiences in my great state. Shifting to another question. As has been discussed today, Treasury approved the systematic risk designation on March 12th upon the recommendation of the Federal Reserve and FDIC. I want to discuss for a little bit the process leading up to this. I think it's important that we have a clear picture of how the regulators made this designation, and not just in theory, but in practice. So, Vice Chair Barr, could you provide insight into which regulator acted first in proposing that uninsured deposits be protected? These are the kind of questions I'm getting back home. And were there, and while you're thinking about that, were there discussions between FDIC and Fed prior to the respective board meetings? I see our time, my time has expired, but I'm happy to follow up with you. Well, you can go ahead and answer it. I'm I bet somebody really heightened right now and interested. Plus, we're close to getting a little break here, so. I'm, I'm happy to. So, Please, uh, thank you. We, we, were in, we were in conversations, uh, all, all, all three agencies, uh, over the course of, of that weekend, uh, trying to think through what the potential ramifications might be uh, in the financial system. It was a, a very difficult judgment. Uh, to make. It involves, of course, information we're getting from around the system, from hearing from community if bankers. The gentleman, if the gentleman will give a timeline of those conversations between the two agencies and the two principals of the FDIC and, and the Fed uh, for a written statement. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. We'll now go to Mr. Vargas of Thank California. You, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, the ranking member. I guess I'm looking at this a little bit differently, and that is uh, we could have been here today looking at the collapse of hundreds of banks. We could have been here today trying to figure out how to stop the contagion. But instead, we're here looking at significant banks with significant problems. And I think that that's important. But I, I think what's more important is that everyone work together. We certainly have our ideological differences, and they're significant. I, mean, I heard right away it was Biden's fault. You know, from some members, and I could easily say it was, hell no, it was Trump's fault. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, we, we're out of our ideological silos and trying to figure out practical solutions. I want to thank the chair. I think the chair worked very, very hard on this, and I think that he probably was a little uncomfortable with his um, ideologues on his side, maybe, but I think he did a fabulous job, and I want to thank him publicly. I think the ranking member did the same. I think they worked very, very closely together to try to figure out, you know, what, what can we do 
as a legislature to make sure that there's not contagion. I want to thank all of you. I think all of you acted um, very honorably, uh, nobly as you should have, to try to figure out what's the solution here. And, and again, I appreciate that, that deeply. I, again, we could be here talking about a disaster, an unmitigated disaster. Uh, I was worried about that. I mean, I worry about these things, and, uh, and we're not. Instead, we're looking at these important issues. So now that we are, and I got that off my chest, I do want to ask you, uh, Mr. Barr, you were quoted quite extensively for saying, let me get it correctly here, I don't want to put uh, words in your mouth. To begin, SVB's failure is a textbook case of mismanagement. Was that a correct quote? Yes. Well, then why, the, the natural question is, to begin, why wasn't there a textbook case of enforcement? I, I think that's a good question, uh, one we're exploring uh, very much. The supervisors uh, looking at the bank identified the problems with the bank, and the question is, did they identify them with enough level of urgency? Did they escalate appropriately? And, and I think that's what is an incredibly fair question we're looking at carefully. I expect that we're going to find that we need to have a, a, a more of an emphasis on supervisors using the tools they have more promptly and putting in mitigants in place more promptly when they see problems uh, at, at banks that they're supervising. Yeah, in, in fact, that's, they had a number of MRAs, MRIAs, I guess, um, and it didn't seem like you did anything other than write a letter. I mean, it didn't seem like there was any enforcement. I mean, where was the stick? Yes, I think that's I think that's exactly the right question. Normally, in in the supervisory process, when a supervisor issues an MRA or an MRIA, the bank promptly takes care of those matters. In this case, obviously, it didn't take care of them in such a way that it prevented its. It, it seems like they blew you off. I mean, it seems like they blew you guys off, and you didn't do anything. I mean, that's what it seems like for reading all this information. I I can tell you, I, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it sounds like. Yeah, I, I think that, again, we're, we're looking at the whole supervisory record. I, I share your concern very much. I think it's something we're going to have to explore both in terms of the way the bank responded and the bank's responsibility <clears throat> for its failure, but also uh, should regulators have used tools to escalate more promptly and quickly? I think that's a completely fair question. Okay. Uh, Chairman uh, Bloomberg, uh, in your hearing before the Senate Banking Committee, you testified that the collapse of SVB and Signature Bank demonstrate the implications that banks with assets over $100 billion can have financial stability issues. I think that's what you, you were quoted. Additionally, you stated that the prudential regulation of these institutions merits serious attention, particularly for capital liquidity and interest rates hike. Can you please elaborate more about what prudential regulations need to be reviewed? What steps can we take to mitigate the potential for similar bank failure? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Look, I think we should start with supervision and how we supervise liquidity risk. And two, two big things in, in this episode was liquidity risk from concentration of uninsured deposits and the accumulation of unrealized losses on the balance sheets of our institutions, both of which go to fundamental management of interest rate risk, which is... Right, but, but the size, I'm talking about the size of the no, bank. I think no, that's and, significant. And, and, I, and I think um, it applies to all institutions. I think in the past, We've looked at these regional banks and smaller regional banks, and in terms of their prudential regulation, have treated them somewhat uh, more lightly than the larger institutions. My time I think is in expired. light of this episode, we need to take a close look okay. at that. Thank That's, you. I that was back. the point I was trying to make. Well, with the wind-up that Mr. Vargas gave, I just want to give him like 10 more minutes, so thank you. Um, with that, we'll now recognize uh, Mr. Loudermilk of um, Georgia for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I know you've been spending a good bit of time on Capitol Hill, but uh, we appreciate you being here. One of the concerns that I've received from a lot of my smaller uh, institutions, smaller banks, is with um, the extension of insuring deposits across the board, uh, they felt vulnerable in that larger institutions may decide to pull deposits that they have in the smaller institutions because then they would be covered. Um, Under Secretary Lang, I, I wanted to get a little clarity on 
what seems like is conflicting accounts from Secretary Yellen, Yellen uh, regarding deposit insurance. Now, on Tuesday, March 21st, the Secretary suggested deposits would be insured. She said, quote, if smaller institutions suffer deposit runs that pose the risk of contagion, then during, that was the end quote, then during her testimony to the Senate Finance Committee the very next day, the Secretary said she was not considering, quote, blanket insurance or guarantees of deposits. But then a day later, she said that Treasury, quote, would be prepared to take additional actions to protect depositors if warranted. Could you clarify the, the Department of Treasury's position regarding deposit insurance? Yes, thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, as Secretary Yellen has said, we have used tools to prevent contagion in the banking system and have reflected a commitment to ensure that all deposits are safe. And that means we would use the tools again, if needed, to ensure that Americans' deposits are safe. So your answer is yes, you would include smaller institutions, smaller banks, community banks, or, I mean, if, I'm, I'm if a little confused. If conditions warranted, that would deposits that smaller institutions could pose a risk of contagion to the broader system, we would absolutely use the tools. So I guess the question would be then, what is that condition? If it starts with one, one uh, community bank, then that would be a trigger, or do, do you have more definition of what would be the condition? I think it's very difficult to just make decisions on the hypothetical, but in this, in this environment that we made the systemic risk determinations based on unanimous approvals from the FDIC and the Fed, we determined that the risk of contagion in the banking system was very high. So with that and you, the action of extending it to larger institutions, regional banks, and, and then smaller institutions, do you have concerns that regulators may be creating moral hazard across the entire banking system? I think the, we are concerned with addressing the current situation that we are facing. We think the system has stabilized. We have information and evidence that deposits have stabilized. We will need to address reforms going forward to address concerns about moral hazard. Okay. And, and I agree with you. I think that we're stable at this point, but as we've seen already, Things can turn around in a 24-hour period, right? And uh, I am one of those that, you know, uh, from raising three young children and now with five grandchildren, children, uh, consequences matter in future behavior, and we can't ignore that going forward. Um, last question. Uh, why did the Secretary's position appear to change regarding the um, extending uh, insurance to various or to smaller institutions. Why did she change her position between the 21st and 23rd? Were there uh, internal discussions going on between the secretary and the president or other prudential regulators that caused the shift? I am not aware of any conversations. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, no further questions at this time, and I yield back. Mr. Kasson of Illinois is recognized for five minutes, and af after this end of the, the series, uh, this, sorry, let me restate this. After these five minutes, uh, we'll give the panel uh, a little five-minute uh, break, uh, stretch your legs, uh, then we'll come back in and we'll, we'll finish with questioning. Uh, my expectation is that then we'll, uh, you know, be able to get through this final segment, uh, but I, I do think it's, um, uh, humane to actually give uh, a panel uh, this bit of break, and frankly, uh, I need one as well. So, uh, Mr. Kasten, five minutes. I'd like to thank the chairman for putting me on the inhumane end of that uh, transaction. Um, uh, Vice Chair Bart, um, I'm trying to understand the calendar, and um, I've, I've got just four or five questions for you, and I'll, I want to walk through the calendar as I understand it. If you, if you disagree with anything I've got in the calendar, let me know. But otherwise, I'll just try to run through quickly to get to the questions. January 2019, SVB is notified by the Fed of deficient risk management. A year later, they're notified that their risk management is not up to large bank standards. 
About two years after that, April 22 to 23, SVB no longer has a risk officer, but in their 2023 proxy statements, they say that they have doubled the number of risk meetings from 9 to 18. Given the prior concerns from the Fed, did the Fed participate in or otherwise have visibility into any of those, those risk, risk meetings at SVB in that window? The calendar you described, the dates didn't, uh, they, they uh, are some of them in the future. I think that we might, we might need to look at the calendar reconciliation together, or maybe I misheard. No, no, I'm just going up to, to January of this year was the last date. From April to, from April of 22 to January of 23, there was no risk officer, but a doubled frequency. Did the Fed participate in any of those risk, risk meetings within SVB during that nine-month period? I, I don't have yet the full supervisory record, so I'm not right. able to answer the question, but do, we will have that information in the May 1st. Report. Okay. Do, do you know if they were at any time cited for violating Section 165 of Dodd-Frank that requires banks over $50 billion to have a risk officer for the nine-month period when they did not? The, the deficiency downgrade that occurred um, in the summer of 2022 focused on a wide range of risk management practices uh, at the firm and found them to be deficient. Okay. Um, moving back to the calendar, Q3 of 2022, their 10Q showed that their held to security bonds were $15.9 billion undervalued relative to mark to market, and they had $15.8 billion in equity at the time. Three months later, their 10K for the year showed a slight improvement. They only had a $15.1 billion overvaluation of their bonds and $16.3 billion in equity. Was it perceived by the Fed or by management that they were in an improved risk situation at the end of 2023 than they were three months earlier? I, I don't know the answer to the question with respect to um, how the management of the firm were viewing the situation. Uh, the supervisors were telling the firm at that time that basically their risk models um, were divorced from reality, that the models suggested they'd earn more money when they were losing more money. Okay. I'm glad to hear that because now I want to move to 2023 and sort of the, what happened up to March 8th. January 26, 2023, about three weeks after they finally got a risk officer back, CEO Becker ex announced that he was going to execute $3.6 in stock sales. February 22nd, he executed those sales. March 8th of 2023, he announced a sale of all of their available to sell equity portfolio to Goldman. The same day was disclosed um, the $1.8 billion loss of a security sale, apparently also to Goldman. Um, heads, Goldman wins. Tails, Goldman wins. Um, and of course, the next day, a $42 billion withdrawal. Do you have any visibility? When was the security sale and or the equity sale to Goldman process initiated? In other words, not was, when was it announced? When, when internally was the, was the company initiating the process to secure additional cash from those two Goldman processes? I, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I imagine you probably also don't know whether the January 26 sale was cleared with their risk officer who had been on board for three weeks when the, when the January 26th announcement was. I, I, I don't yet have full visibility into that transaction. I hope, hope that we'll be able to get as much detail as we can as, as part of our review. Okay. Do you know, if I'm, if I'm Becker, I'm obviously in a lot of trouble. You've got a deposit base that is extremely well healed and very sophisticated. Was there any outreach to the depositors during this period to ask them either to provide equity infusions to the bank or other, other forms of capital prior to them, prior to the run of the bank? I, I do not know. Um, Last question, in, in the exchange with Mr. Scott, you had indicated that the, the, and I think I got this right, that the, the Board of Governors' concerns about SVB were really heightened in mid-February? What, what I said is that the staff presented to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in mid-February on interest rate risk, generally, and one of the firms they highlighted as having interest rate risk was Silicon Valley Bank and the staff indicated that they were doing a further horizontal review and would come back with further um, results of that review. Okay, so is it your position that the trigger for the heightened security was simply interest rate movement or was it anything else about this calendar that triggered that heightened concern? 
uh, I, I didn't describe it as heightened concern. Basically, the, the staff were presenting on interest rate broadly, and the firm they singled out as having interest rate risk was Silicon Valley Bank, and they discussed the horizontal review they were doing and the fact they'd come back with further information after that horizontal review. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Is this supervision? Okay. Uh, we'll now stand a recess. The committee stands a recess for five minutes.
<laughs> the committee will come to order. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rose for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, before I get into my questions, uh, Chair Grunberg, I'd like to say that as you consider any new special assessment on banks to replenish the deposit insurance fund, that you use your special exemptive authority in implementing that assessment to ensure that Tennessee bankers, and frankly bankers in a number of other states across the country, are not paying for the mistakes of Californian and New York bankers serving wealthy real estate moguls and tech-related venture capitalists. Tennessee bankers understand how to manage risks and should not be punished for the mistakes of those uh, in our coastal banks. Now I'd like to jump right into my questions as time is limited. Chair Grunberg, the, the value of First Citizens Bank is up over 50 percent over just the last five days and is still rising. Shareholders have benefited by three billion dollars by last calculation. Chair Grunberg, why did the FDIC cap its potential gain on First Citizen stock at $500 million. I think it was a negotiation, Congressman, and that's what we were able to, uh, to work out. And so why not allow the federal government to recoup more of its losses? Why not uh, and share in, the, in this outsized gain at First Citizens? I, I wouldn't argue with that, but we had a negotiation with the acquiring institution, and that's what we came out with. Okay. I think you had good negotiators at the table? Uh, <laughs> maybe we could have been better, I don't know. Okay. Uh, and Chair Greenberg, um, did you receive any pressure from the White House or other elected officials not to allow for consolidation of large or mid-sized banks with Silicon Valley Bank as part of the review process of potential bidders? No, Congressman. Okay. Vice Chair Barr, as you know, as committee members, we have been undergoing a series of briefings with regulators, uh, both at the state and federal level, on these bank failures. Earlier this week, I learned that the California banking regulators were conducting their ex examinations of SBB remotely. Vice Chair Barr, can you tell us whether or not the Fed was also conducting its examinations remotely or on site and in person? My understanding is that there's a mix of activities. I, I don't know how much was on site. A lot of activity occurs remotely, doing analytical work and so on, but I, I don't have a precise answer to that question. I hope you will provide that answer to us. As a former uh, bank board member, I know there's nothing that strikes fear in the hearts of a banker more than an on-site review, and maybe uh, for good reason and perhaps more effective. So. We would like to know, I'd like to personally know the answer to that question as you conduct your review. You said earlier, and I think reaffirmed your quote, that this was a textbook case of mismanagement. Um, I hope that you will conduct the thorough review to decide whether the oversight by the Fed examiners was, was being done in the way that it should and that the escalation of that uh, up to the uh, through your process was appropriate and that uh, you will take appropriate actions. It seems to me, and I'll just say that, the, again, based on my personal firsthand experience, that you have the tools you need, and the question is, were they being used effectively? And, and I hope that in the days ahead, weeks ahead, we get to the answer for that question. Uh, under Secretary Liang, earlier uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Loudermilk, uh, was questioning you about some of the comments of Secretary Yellen. And um, I, I guess I'm still a little bit confused because I think what I'm hearing both from the Secretary and maybe from you is that if, uh, if it's a systemically important bank that's failing, that uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, perhaps a more strident effort to make sure that no one loses. But if it's a less significant bank, like maybe the one that I was uh, director at, that uh, perhaps the, the concern won't be as high. And uh, Can you clear that up for me, or, and, and am I mishearing what you and the Secretary are saying? Um, yes, yes, Congressman. The, the point that we've been making is that we would use the systemic risk exception or our uh, end tools to prevent contagion in the broader system if a bank were to fail. And that could be a bank of different sizes, and it would be designed to keep all American depositors safe.
safe. You understand, no doubt, the confusion that, does, that these statements leave some of us with. And so I just wonder, do you have confidence in Secretary Yellen at this stage? Absolutely. And so, you know, as I think about what, what I've heard today earlier, Al Green, uh, I, I know it's not a quote of my mother, but it's a quote I heard often, is that it doesn't just have to be right, it has to look right. And so as I leave you, gentlemen and ladies, this 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 uh, afternoon, I would just say uh, the American people are watching, and I think right now we have grave concerns about whether the regulatory process uh, looks right. And so I hope you take that to heart as you conduct the review of what you're doing. I don't think, uh, my personal conviction is that you don't need new tools, that you need uh, better craftsmen using those tools to, to accomplish the purposes that you have. And so I commend that to you. As a, again, as a former bank board member, I feel like if Silicon Valley Bank had had the supervision that I feel like our bank got, that we wouldn't be here today talking about this. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, is recognized for Thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Waters. Uh, the conditions at Silicon Valley Bank in the months leading up to its failure set the stage for a classic run on the bank. What was not typical of the situation, though, was the speed and intensity of the run, as we've talked about. Depositors driven by panic on social media platforms and armed with online banking tools, capable of rapidly moving large sums of money, withdrew nearly, nearly $42 billion in deposits within 24 hours on the 9th of March. Uh, Secretary, Under Secretary Lang, do you think social media and online banking tools have the potential to increase the intensity of future runs? And if so, what do you think the appropriate response from Treasury, Congress, and regulators should be? Congressman, I, I do agree that the runs that occurred at Silicon Valley were unprecedented in speed and size, aided by social media technology. Those are new risks that challenge the banking system and the financial system and are those that we'll you know, definitely need to be considering um, and working with Congress on those issues. So you're working on that? We, um, yes, there is, we've been working on how to think about the payment system, mm -hmm. how to think about fintech and digital assets, and this has now also been a, become apparent. Thanks. I'd like to work with you on that. If that's okay, I'll follow up. Thank you. Some members of Congress are using the failures of Silicon Valley's bank management and bank supervisors to criticize the bipartisan 2018 amendment to Dodd-Frank that ended the one-size-fits-all approach to bank regulation. Uh, before Dodd-Frank, we had a system of too big to fail. We don't want a system, in my opinion, where banks are too small to succeed. Those that say Congress eliminated annual stress tests and other prudential safeguards need to read the bill again. The bill tasked the Federal Reserve with crafting rules for banks like SVB with more than $100 billion in assets. And Section 104 of the 2018 Amendment to Dodd-Frank says clearly, quote, the Board of Governors may, by order or rule, apply any prudential standard established under this section to any bank holding company with assets equal to or greater than $100 billion if the Board of Governors determines the prudential standards is appropriate to mitigate risks in the banking system and promote safety and soundness. And quote, the Federal Reserve could and should have applied annual stress tests to banks like SVB, but it chose not to. While stress tests are an important component, it's clear the existing Fed supervisory tools are equally, if not more, important. During a Senate Finance Committee hearing earlier this month, Treasury Secretary Yellen was asked about supervisory stress tests, and her response was, quote, supervisory stress tests focus on capital and not on liquidity. In these bank failures, liquidity played an important role. When Secretary Yellen was asked whether stress tests would expose management failures at banks, she replied that, quote, that's the purpose of supervision, concluding that supervision is critical. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, do you agree with comments made by Secretary Yellen that supervision is critical to identifying the failures of bank management? And there was a, a whole, clear that there was a huge hole in Fed supervision of SVB. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? I think uh, supervision and regulation uh, both play an important role in overseeing bank management. And in, in obviously, in the first instance, and in the last instance, it's bank management that's responsible for running the bank. And in this case, it did it in a way that caused its failure. We are taking a careful look at the role of supervision and regulation and not forcing managers to do a better job in running their own bank. Just digging in a little bit more, the Wall Street Journal reported that the Fed had concerns about the risk management practices at SVB as early as 2019. You admitted in your testimony that the Fed knew that there were issues at SVB for years and only started a more in-depth review in February 2023, which I worry was too little too late. When exactly does the Fed give these supervisory reviews some more muscle and step in to prevent disaster. And can you talk a little bit more about what happened here and what you're trying to learn? 
Thanks. Uh, thank you. A, a great series of questions. You know, the, the Federal Reserve system of supervision and regulation is based on a tailored approach where uh, firms between 50 and 100 billion are really part of the regional banking organization group. Firms 100 billion and above are in the large and, and foreign banking organization and group. And even within that, there are distinctions between firms at 100 to 250 and 250 and above. And I think part of the problem is that that framework, which really focuses on asset size, is not sensitive to the kinds of uh, problems we saw here with respect to rapid growth in a concentrated business model. That's one of the reasons why, you know, earlier this year I announced that we were going to have a novel supervision group uh, that really focuses on these kinds of issues. So to that point, do you think, uh, you said yesterday before the Senate that the Federal Reserve has broad authority to apply additional prudential standards to banks with more than $100 billion in assets like Silicon Valley Bank. Is this a situation where the Fed needs different authorities, or has the Fed simply chosen not to use the authorities given by Congress? Like, what, 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 where should you be jumping in? We're, we're going to look at our own framework, our own supervision, our own regulation. I think that self-assessment is really critical part of risk management. As I mentioned earlier, we have a team of staff working on it who are not responsible for supervising SVB. We're going to look at our own structure and, and suggest reforms. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is recognized. Well, thank each of you for testifying today. Um, let me ask a, a very simple question. You know, you had a, we had a $209 billion bank in assets have a total meltdown from March 8th through March 26th. 18 days, you had a bank basically from all outward appearances was strong uh, to the taxpayer, to the investor. And over those 18 days, it was, it was a meltdown. Now, the warning signs that have been mentioned at this hearing, like the six citations, like the absence of a chief risk officer for eight months, like the deficient government and controls, the, the signals were there for a bank that was in trouble. I didn't, when the chairman started it off, I didn't see a sense of urgency from any of y'all on things to do other than we contacted staff or we contacted the immediate supervisors. When I was a director on the bank, if one of these citations had been issued, somebody's head would roll. We'd be having a conference call. Take, give, the, give me some assurance that I'm wrong, or I guess give me some assurance what specific actions you would take if this is duplicated. Because you had $20 million lost in uh, the insurance fund, which the calls I'm fielding in my office are from the smaller banks. And, you know, a lot of people denying the taxpayers are going to take the hit. The taxpayers are going to take the hit at the end of the day because they're the ones that make the profit for the banks to pay the fees to the FDIC. Give me some – what does it take to get y'all's attention and to put a sense of urgency to situations like this? I, I think it's an incredibly urgent situation. Uh, when obviously we learned of the immediate distress of the firm, we stepped in and took decisive action to make sure uh, every American's deposits are safe, and we put in place a liquidity measure to make sure that banks all across the country would have the liquidity they need uh, in, in case uh, any institution uh, were. were talking about over the weekend, when you found out on a Thursday, you talking about over the weekend you took these steps. I'm talking about, did you not get these warning signals ahead of time? Uh, uh, sir, the, the bank supervisory staff certainly issued those warnings to the bank. Uh, the question we're looking at the review is why those were not escalated in a more rapid way. I, I agree with you. You know, we want banks to be paying attention to supervisors, and almost every bank in the country, as you just described, if you get a letter like this, you get a series of problems like this. They had many, many problems. I'm focusing on liquidity and management and, and interest rate risk. But they had many other problems, too. You have a bank like that not responding, that's a real problem. In your role as regulators, what would you do differently for each of you? I, I think I'd start with making sure that we, we escalate things faster and, and intervene more promptly with respect to mitigation. But, but as I said, we, we've just started this review. I'm going to get a staff review back, and I want to really hear their expert judgment. Uh, without without any preconception about what they're going to come up with. Did they jump to conclusions on rating having this as a systemic risk? Uh, pardon me? Was it the right decision for the uh, uh, president to issue this, or I guess the board that voted on it, yeah. to issue this as a 
uh, or to deem this a systemic risk? I, th I think it was the correct judgment, sir. Uh, it was a very difficult judgment, I know, for everyone, but a unanimous Federal Reserve Board, unanimous Board of the FDIC, and the Treasury Secretary agreed after consulting with the President. I think it was the right thing to do for the country. I think it saved a lot of small businesses and, small and households, community banks, regional banks, from a kind of contagion that really um, could, could have been quite destabilizing. And we're now in a situation where I, I can say the banking system is sound and resilient. I think that was really the right thing to do. Well, I sure hope so. What this has done is rattle the markets. I'm in the commercial, uh, was in the commercial real estate business. And banks that are loaned into commercial ventures are shook right now, particularly on the concentrations of credit on where they put their money. And particularly for that family that's put their life savings in an account that they thought uh, was insured. What about the, the uh, what's your opinion on raising the, I, I get asked questions, the $250,000 insured limit? Yeah, let me respond, if I may, Congressman. It um, uh, seems to me that the decision to guarantee the deposits of these two institutions really raises that question up. <clears throat> As I indicated in my testimony, uh, the FDIC is going to undertake a comprehensive review of our deposit insurance system. Certainly one of the things we will look at and identify different options for consideration is the scope of coverage and whether we should increase coverage overall or for particular well, I would like to see, I'm running out of time, I'd like to see those reports if you could furnish that, we, as well as uh, if it had, if, if, if a rerun of what, what happened to these two banks happens again, what decisive role y'all would take that you may have not taken earlier. I yield back. And the report will be out on May the, Congressman, the report will be out by May 1. The gentleman yields. Uh, the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is recognized. Thank you, Chair McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and all of our witnesses for joining us for this critical hearing. I know it's been a long morning, um, but that being said, I truly hope that this is the first and not the last hearing that we're going to have on these recent bank failures. Now, when SVB collapsed in my office, uh, received urgent phone calls, texts, and letters from throughout our district from our constituents who were genuinely shocked and afraid for their future. Affordable housing residents unsure about the status of mortgages, tech companies not able to pay their employees, small businesses worried that they had lost most of their money. Now, while I'm glad we did avoid the worst possible scenario, Congress should consider SVB collapse a wake-up call and take action. After the 2008 financial crisis, Congress stepped up to enact Dodd-Frank, a comprehensive package of regulations in order to prevent bank failures and systemic risks that hurt the economy. However, in 2018, the Republican majority in Congress passed a deregulation bill that stripped away crucial requirements and got rid of enhanced prudential standards. Donald Trump and Republicans, including some of my colleagues sitting in this very room, celebrated signing this dangerous piece of legislation. The 2018 deregulation law specifically made it easy for SVB and Signature Bank to engage in risky management practices with little to no oversight, and we must rightfully assign some of the responsibility for this bank turmoil to deregulation efforts. Vice Chair Barr, when Congress passed the deregulation bill in 2018, which was lobbied for by banks like SVB, is it fair to say that it reduced supervision requirements by the Fed for small and medium-sized banks? The overall effect of the law was, was for the, small, the smallest banks um, to reduce regulatory burden for, for banks within 50 to 100 billion in rage uh, to limit the Federal Reserve's discretion with respect to those institutions. Uh, but for institutions over 100 billion, uh, the Federal Reserve retained discretion uh, to do something different. It chose in, in 2019 to put in place a set of rules um, that I think had the effect overall of reducing supervision and regulation of such firms. Right. So it definitely did. Deregulation bill, relaxed requirements for stress tests, and resolution plans. The dangerous and irresponsible nature of this deregulation bill was completely predictable. In no way was this turmoil inevitable. The, Fed, the then Federal Reserve Governor Brainard opposed it, as well as both of you, Vice Chair Barr and Chair Gruenberg. And yet here we are. In the aftermath of the collapse of SVB and Signature Bank, it's clear that the Republican deregulation bill shares the blame alongside Treasury, the Federal Reserve, 
and the FDIC due to the lapses in supervision and oversight. Chairman Grunberg, for folks who are concerned about the future of small and medium-sized banks in this country, what assurances can you give them? Well, Congresswoman, um, as a general matter, our small and medium-sized banks remain in good condition, including their liquidity. And um, uh, I think the actions we took did help to stabilize the system. And um, I think, uh, as I indicated, uh, any, uh, any expense by the deposit insurance fund to cover uninsured depositors will be imposed through a special assessment on the industry, and we have discretion to tailor that assessment to the institutions that most directly benefited. So we're going to try to be thoughtful in this process. Thank you. And I'm requesting that each of your agencies provide my office and this committee by May 1st a list of recommended regulations that need to be enacted to strengthen the banking industry and to prevent future failures. Um, the story of SVB's collapse is the story of a Republican administration in cahoots with the banking industry to weaken our financial regulations, but it is also a story of regulators' failure to do their number one job, regulate banks. And since I'm accused of this often, I think I will close with a wokeism. The American public are tired of the super wealthy pocketing bonuses and leaving working class folks hiding the bag for their fiscal mismanagement. They're even more tired of Congress allowing them to do it. It is time to regulate. Thank you, and I yield. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized. Uh, thank the chairman. Thank our witnesses. Appreciate uh, your endurance here uh, today and yesterday. And uh, as uh, I listen to my colleague ask questions, I know my, co my constituents are tired of um, seeing Washington, D.C., Congress in particular, socialized risk, and watch profits be privatized. But they're also tired of people that don't listen. So I think one of the things that, Mr. Barr, when I was listening to what you said uh, yesterday and today, S-2155 isn't the reason that these banks failed. Uh, these banks were over $100 billion in assets, and therefore it's just a red herring. Isn't that accurate? Uh, what I would say is that the Federal Reserve's rules issued in the wake of 29, uh, 20, uh, 2019, um, sorry, in the wake of the legislation that were issued in 2019, uh, they did have the effect of, of lowering supervisory and regulatory standards for firms, but, but the Federal Reserve retains the discretion to have different rules. And one of the things that I think would be uh, my job going forward is to put in place rules that are appropriate for that size institution. We have the discretion to do that. Yeah, thank you. And, and so obviously uh, it, it wasn't the regulation per se that failed, it was the regulator that failed. And I, I want to understand the context in which that uh, occurred. So over the past year and a half, we've seen a substantial increase in the federal funds rate. And during that span, are you aware if the Fed or other prudential regulators had conversations not specific to Silicon Valley Bank uh, about the inevitable interest rate risk uh, that that presents? Yes, yeah, so that, that is a core topic in supervision. Uh, supervisors were very focused on interest rate risk. Uh, it was an important part of uh, what we highlighted in our fall supervision report. Examiners were given beginning uh, this year extra training, uh, sorry, beginning last year extra training on um, interest rate risk. So it is, it is just a bread and butter supervisory issue. It's not some esoteric problem. So in that sense, did Silicon Valley Bank's f failure surprise you? Its failure did surprise me. Its, its risk-taking uh, was excessive, but even then, uh, I did not anticipate, I don't think anybody anticipated, that they'd have a, a devastating bank run that basically wiped out, you know, $42 billion on, on uh, Thursday afternoon, another $100 billion expected the next day. That would be 85 percent of its deposit base uh, in a 24-hour period. That was shocking. Yeah, so we're anxious to understand all the, all the factors that drove that run. Uh, on, on that particular bank, but we're also curious when you stated yesterday to Senator Kennedy that stress testing does not examine institutional risks precipitating from interest rate risk. And when we were on the conference call with, with Treasury, with Fed, with FDIC, uh, with House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats, uh, I asked the question, and there's some complex model that the stress test involves, and said, well, if macroeconomic conditions and whatever 
kick in, well, I submit that the hold to maturity spread has to be considered, uh, not just the uh, available for sale risk because of the need for liquidity. Is that something that you're focused on as you conduct your review? Yes, I think you're absolutely right that we need to look at, at both sides of the balance sheet. We need, need to look at the liability structure and the asset structure. And, and, and the whole point is to assess whether under certain conditions you can have more stress on the liability side that forces you to sell on the asset side. Those are, those are interrelated. Mr. Grunberg, do you share that concern about uh, how we're looking at systemic risk? Yes, I do, Congressman. I, I would love to go into everything that I could on this, but you know, Mr. Barr, on March 9th, you gave a speech that touched on stable coins and brought up specific risks associated with stable coins. In that speech, you stated, quote, the mismatch, this mismatch in value and liquidity is the recipe for a classic bank run. Stable coin, is, stable coin issuers are not supervised by the Fed and lack capital and liquidity as a backstop. Uh, the banks we regulate, in contrast, are well protected from bank runs through a robust array of supervisory requirements. Would you revise those comments if you could? Yes, I think that, you know, it, it demonstrates the need for humility in thinking about how financial risk happens in the system. That, that's been a theme of basically all of my academic work on, on, on systemic risk is we need humility, and that's, that's why you need really strict capital and liquidity rules because of exactly the kind of circumstance we just saw. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, you know, I'll note, obviously, stable coins are backed by assets and are properly regulated in many states, including the state of New York. The last thing I'd say is we have this pressure for uh, to socialize more of the market. Uh, there are credit unions that are completely privately insured, many in my district and in others, and I think we should look to that market for private credit risk insurance. I yield. The gentleman yields. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is now recognized. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here. Um, Vice Chair Barr, Silicon Valley Bank, which I feel like no one's focusing more on them as the bad actor here uh, and the mismanagement and the inappropriate actions. Um, you know, you kept saying over and over again that they weren't responding. Uh, if you had, you know, we, we should have done something when we knew they weren't responding. I mean, what could have been done? It's an, it's an excellent point. I mean, I, I agree with you. You start with the basic problem that, that bank, the bank managers mismanage the bank. Did they hide something from us? What did they, they, they hid, they hid all this from us. Do you believe they hid this intentionally from, from the feds? Um, I, I don't have access yet to the full supervisory yeah. records. Will you let us know? Because I really do think they misled and probably lied uh, and made some inappropriate and fraudulent probably actions that I hope that we'll hold them accountable to. We, we, we will definitely be looking into that, and we retain enforcement authority to go after uh, people who, at the bank, who violated the law or who breached their fiduciary duty or who engaged in unsafe and unsound practices, and we will, we will hold them accountable yeah, and Chairman, to the fullest let's, let's not negotiate with bad actors like that. We think this is the time to really hold them accountable, honestly. Uh, this is how we set a precedent. But going back to you, Vice Chair Barr, bonuses were paid out when? When was the last bonus paid out before they? As failed? I said, I'm still getting access to the We know it, it was a couple hours before, correct? I've heard news reports about that, but I want to make sure. So you don't sure even that know when the full. bonuses were paid out? You don't have that information for this committee right now? I do not have that information was right now. Was it the now. day of? I, I would like to respond to you fully and accurately, and I want to be careful to do that properly. I've heard news, news reports about the timing, but I don't How have the How come the news knows, but we don't? Uh, pardon me? How come the media and the news know, but we don't? Uh, How I, do you not know this before our financial service? Because this is important. I agree with I, I have I share your outrage about it. I just want to make sure we get to the facts. Do you even know how much the bonuses were? As I said, I, I think you're, you're hitting at exactly the right issues. We're going to use our enforcement authority to the fullest extent possible. Well, now, you know, everyone's saying, oh, we're going to go ahead and introduce some clawback legislation to see. But, you know, Chair, Chairman Grubick, I asked the Fed Chair Powell about this. You know Section 956. It's been, what, 12, 13 years? When are we going to have a rulemaking on that? This is about excessive pay. This is about, I mean, this is something that Congress already considered. So how come it's over a decade that we don't have anything rulemaking? In 2016, there was a proposal. It wasn't great, but it was a really great start. It would have been instrumental here. 
Yeah, no, I'm familiar with the rulemaking, Congresswoman. I was strongly supportive of it. Uh, we didn't complete it in time. Why? Why? Well, I think there was a change of administrations, and that may have had something to do with it. Every reason to come back to it now and complete that rulemaking. And if I think you had it today, what could you have done? With, well, in this would, instance, it because given I, I'm tired of being asked to pass things when it, it I feel like we already did, but it it's over given, 12 years that we don't actually have something again that we could have used as a tool. It just answered, it, it would have given, ex, given us explicit clawback authority on compensation. As I pointed out earlier, we do have, in fact, a legal obligation, the FDIC, to investigate the uh, board and management of failed institutions and hold them accountable uh, for the, for any misconduct that might have occurred. Yeah, public advocates really believe this could have maybe prevented this. And, and so we'll Primarily have, because as you, you guys know that there's some inappropriate decisions made up so they can do the bonuses. And that's- And the and, payouts. And that's what we're gonna- It's clear as day, and I don't know why my colleagues are not even talking about that. They're that talking about you all not getting things that, well, they didn't respond. How come nobody's mad at the bank for not responding? All I can tell you, We've initiated the investigations to get the facts to take action in regard, Chairman, assuming the facts support Chairman the Grimberg, allegations. Please, for the American people, we need a rulemaking decision on Section 956. You know how critically important this is. Understood. This is what, five, I think it was, I read somewhere, this is the 563rd bank to fail since 2001. There are going to be more. And I, I know understand. you guys don't want to talk about it, but there will be because they'll mislead us, they'll lie, they'll do anything for the bayouts. I mean, even the... The risk, what's that risk manager person? What did she give herself? Where was it? They, I mean, this is a crazy amount of money she walked out with. I mean, it's crazy. And then Gary Becker, the CEO, sold February 27th, $3 million worth of stock, netting $2.2 million. And he knew this was going to be where we land. And we're not angry about that. We're angry because you guys didn't notice. Well, what about the fact they don't respond? They don't respond to inquiries and things. The, I mean, the gentlewoman's that's time has expired. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we know that uh, the receivership for SBB went into, uh, occurred on, the, on Friday, March 9th. Sunday morning, Secretary Yellen uh, stated that the American banking system on national television was really, really safe and well capitalized. <clears throat> on Sunday night, Secretary Yellen approved the FDIC to protect all depositors at SBB and certainly implied all bank deposits beyond the 250K would also be secured. So my first question to uh, uh, Vice Chair Barr, what data over that time period drove you to go beyond the SVB and Signature, uh, which was made aware, I guess, on Sunday? And did you, did you think that if you were to protect an idiosyncratic bank uh, such as SVB, you would need to protect all? What, what data drove you to protect imply that all bank deposits would be secured? The, the decisions that we made that, uh, that weekend were obviously in a very compressed period of time. Uh, they involved not only gathering information about what's going on in the economy, but also the exercise of judgment. Uh, it was our judgment collectively on the Federal Reserve Board, the unanimous decision, the unanimous decision of the FDIC and the Treasury Secretary, that we needed to do that to protect contagion from infecting healthy banks in the system, right. community banks, regional banks around the country. It is a judgment call. It was based on the information we had at the time. I think it was the correct decision. Right. I can't pro I don't want to prolong it, but so there was actual data from other banks that they could be in, in, in jeopardy from we, we were a systematic we were problem. I'm sorry, I didn't it, mean it to being a off. systematic problem as opposed to a unique problem. As you said, it's a, it's a human judgment, but the information we were getting from other oh. regional banks suggested pressure that was building. It may and have been the right call. I'm just wondering what data drove Secretary Yellen to go from, hey, everything's okay, to eight hours later, no, we're going to protect all, all, all deposits. I'm going I'm to move on. Chair Grunberg, um, it was stated that as well as all bank deposits being, being secured, no cost to taxpayers. I understand the FDIC fund would, is understood to pay for it, as you stated, per, per law. Uh, but will FDIC rates go up on community and regional banks? And aren't banks taxpayers too? Well, they certainly are, Congressman. As, as I've explained previously, just to be clear, um, you know, the 
the action covered uninsured depositors at those two institutions. And the FDIC is required by law that any loss to the deposit insurance fund as a result of those uninsured deposits has to be paid for by a special assessment on the banking industry. And we have authority under the law uh, to consider the types of entities that benefit from any action taken or assistance. So we have discretion in designing the implementation of the assessment. Okay. And well, as I indicated previously, we're keenly sensitive to the potential impact on community banks. Well, good, because they are very concerned, as you know, community and regional banks, that they will pay for the bad actions of, of a few. And I'm, I'm glad you're, you're very much aware of that. So, uh, Vice Chair Barr, um, excessive spending by Congress, QE, the Fed doubling its balance sheet from $4 trillion to $9 trillion, no surprise to you, uh, followed by uh, the quantitative tightening, many banks holding excessive treasuries were highly devalued and devastated in the case of, of SVB. So, so um, the November 21st, there are reports that the Fed, on November 21st of 2022, there's a report that the Fed was aware of the balance sheet issues of SVB. Uh, were you, I mean, this is the 16th largest bank in the country, 57% of its portfolio is, was in uh, treasuries being devalued. Uh, why wasn't there more enforcement taking place? Uh, I, I think it's an excellent question. We were aware and, and focused at the supervisory level of interest rate risk in the firm and liquidity risk, risk of the firm. I, I don't think the supervisors expected, I don't think anybody expected uh, a devastating bank run of the kind I described before with 85% of deposits fleeing in, or, or, or expected to flee in a 24-hour in a period. 16th largest bank. You can see why people find that uh, unacceptable from an enforcement standpoint. Last, they only have 10 seconds. There's a high concentration of commercial real estate loans uh, out there owned by small banks, uh, potentially as loans will be uh, – I'll follow up with you on that one in writing. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, is recognized. Thank you. When interest rates rise, long-term securities become less valuable, but deposits become more valuable. If you have a stable deposit base, the gains from the deposits can offset the losses from long-term securities. But if you have an unstable deposit base, like Silicon Valley Bank, there's no built-in offset. Silicon Valley Bank had a uniquely uninsured, unstable deposit base that made it singularly susceptible to a bank run in the age of social media. So, Vice Chair Barr, should a bank with an unstable, uninsured deposit base like SVB be subject to a higher standard of regulation than a bank with a stable, insured deposit base? Uh, Representative Torres, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think you described the situation exactly correctly. Um, and the unique Flattery will win you no points, but you. I, it, it's just the truth. I wish I had said it that way. Um, but, but no, I think there, there are unique risks to this kind of heavy, uninsured deposit base. And, for most banks in the country, as you described, they handle their interest rate risk properly. They have stable deposits. Uh, you know, I know all of you, and when you talk to your banks and you go back home across the country, they're, they're doing okay. But you agree that we should, the rigor of regulation should depend not only on size but on deposit stability, yes? I do. Okay. Uh, to, regarding commercial real estate, the rapid rise of work from home during COVID has driven down office property values, and the rapid rise of interest rates have driven up financing costs creating a perfect storm. Office buildings with declining property values are set to be refinanced at far higher interest rates. There's reportedly $2.5 trillion in commercial real estate debt coming due over the next five years, a substantial share of which is office debt. Uh, Mr. Gru uh, Chair Gruenberg, to what extent do you worry about the office loan portfolio representing a ticking time bomb in the banking system? It, it presents a risk. It's one the, I, the FDIC has talked about and identified publicly. And Signature was the largest commercial real estate lender in New York City. How much of Signature's commercial real estate portfolio consists of office real estate? That's a good question. I, let me get you the exact note. It's a substantial portion can of Can you get me back an answer in writing? I can get that for you. Uh, more important to me locally, uh, residential real estate. Signature Bridge Bank has a por housing portfolio of 3,000 properties consisting of 80,000 units in New York City. The portfolio includes 479 properties consisting of 19,000 units in the Bronx, where I serve as a congressman. I have two questions for the FDIC. 
as you go through the process of seeking a buyer for Signature's residential real estate debt, to what extent will you seek the input of New York State and New York City housing officials who have an obvious stake in preserving the affordability of these properties and units? And to what extent will you prioritize affordable housing preservation in your selection of a purchaser? Thank you, Congressman. Just to be clear, you know, we have uh, sold Signature to New York community. You sold everything but the real estate portfolio, as I understand. That's, that's been, been publicly reported. Well, I take your point. No, um, we'll be glad to work with, with you and other local officials in New York in regard to the disposition. I appreciate that commitment. Sure. Um, uh, I'm not advocating the following course of action, but, but I want to provide you with a hypothetical. The banking system is reportedly sitting on more than $600 billion in unrealized losses from securities, and those losses will only rise with rising interest rates. Since the problem with these assets is one of asset duration rather than asset quality, should the Federal Reserve consider purchasing these securities? Unlike a bank, which needs liquidity to honor obligations to depositors, the Federal Reserve has the ability to hold these assets to a maturity without realizing those unrealized losses. Wouldn't that solve the problem? You, you raise a, an excellent point. Under, under existing law, we uh, cannot take do asset purchases but what we do do is provide ample liquidity to the financial system on the basis but, of those But the assets. losses remain, even with the emergency liquidity, the losses remain on the balance sheet. Those losses are arguably undercutting public confidence in the banking system. And as you know, banking is as much about psychology mm -hmm. as it is about finance. Would, why not just remove the losses? I, I, I'd go back to the, to the first point you made in your, in your earlier question, which is that for, for most banks, they're managing this well. They're doing fine. They're stable. They have stable deposits, and they don't need um, uh, to, to sell the assets they have on their balance sheet. Those assets can stay there and be held to maturity. If institutions need liquidity, they can get access to that from the discount window, and from the program we established, the bank term funding program gives longer-term stability at par for those very assets. I, I want to squeeze in one more question. Uh, did the bank supervisor at the San Francisco Fed have the supervisory authority? to prevent Silicon Valley Bank from investing in unhedged long-term securities? Did you have that authority? Like, is the problem a lack of authority or a failure to exercise the authority you had? The, the, the bank examiners uh, cited them for, for not behaving properly with respect. But did they have the authority to prevent it? The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman can answer uh, on the record. Uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is recognized for five minutes. Hey, Mr. Chairman. It seems that Washington continues to create crisis after crisis and then come in to bail out the crisis. You go back to 2008, uh, it was the policies coming out of Washington that everyone was entitled to own a home. And it didn't matter what their credit score was, whether they were able to pay it back. It was a human right. And fast forward a few years, uh, the compounding impact of that resulted in uh, the 2008 financial crisis. So what did we learn from that? I would argue nothing. The government came in, uh, bailed everybody out, well, bailed out the big banks, caused uh, chaos in the smaller banks, and picked winners and losers. And that's a theme I'm going to be hitting on, picking winners and losers, because the free market capitalism is supposed to have consequences. And when the government continues to bail out bad decisions and pick winners and losers, it, it severely impacts the free market, and it undermines our ability to compete in the global economy. So uh, 2008... Um, we understand the policies coming out of Washington caused a crisis. We had two votes. First vote failed on TARP, second vote passed. It was very painful. I was not here, but at the end of the day, it uh, solved the short-term problem. But we didn't learn anything. Uh, we did learn one thing, actually. It was that the TARP vote wasn't fun. So in 2008, we gave extraordinary uh, power to the executive branch to avoid a future TARP vote. And this is the first time that you all have... Uh, use that authority. So let's fast forward to 2023. Um, a number of policies coming out of Washington, particularly the emphasis on uh, ESG and on DEI, and that compounded with the uh, spending of trillions and trillions of dollars that caused inflation, which resulted in higher interest rates, destabilized SVB and Signature. So we didn't really learn anything in 08 because we used the 2010 authorities, we, uh, the executive branch used the 2010 authorities to, again, pick winners and losers. So 
there's no consequences for risk taking. There's no consequences for poor decisions. And we keep talking about what caused this. Really, it's three things. The San Francisco Fed's misplaced priorities. Last fall, when every other Fed was sending out uh, notifications regarding interest rates and inflation and the impact on future stress stressors of the banking system, they were still sending out DEI and ESG uh, updates. So that, combined with the SPV and signature mismanagement and the inflation we created, caused this problem, and we have, again, not learned anything, bailed out, uh, poor decision-making. Um, I guess I want to start with Undersecretary Liang. I, I, is this a, a problem? I mean, we invoke the systemic risk exception and cover both insured and uninsured depositors. Uh, is it not creating more systemic risk in the overall system because capitalism is no longer a thing? The government's backstopping everything? Is that is that a concern? Congressman, I, I understand your question and your concern. In this case, the systemic risk exception was taken. Depositors, all depositors were covered. Shareholders and debt holders were not. They lost their investment. Those who took the risk lost their investments in this case. Um, I do think this situation, the actions were taken to prevent contagion to spreading to other banks. It was to help safe banks, small and other regionals, who were losing their deposits to either the largest banks or to outside the banking system. I do think this re requires that we will need to be assessing and looking for but, but the lack of consequences, the government continuing to pick winners and losers. And I, I mean, my biggest thing is the justification. Treasury and the White House both said that uh, there's no taxpayer dollars and that what about the people that are going to miss payroll? Um, neither one of those were necessarily true because it is taxpayer dollars because the increased premiums from FDIC is going to be passed down to Americans all over the country. And so they are taxpayers, so that is their dollars. It's not coming out of the general fund, but it's semantics. And as it relates to payroll, I mean, only $22 plus billion is going to be at issue. So there were opportunities to make them whole. I just really think that, one, delegating um, the ability to bail out banks to the executive branch is dangerous. And two, uh, bailing out these banks in this manner has caused more problems uh, than was possibly worth it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you and to the ranking member for uh, bringing us together for this really important hearing. And um, I just first wanted to start with just a quick question to the three of you because I've been troubled by the word of the use crisis. I know I shared that with a ranking member the other day that, you know, I never saw this as a crisis. Perhaps it was a boo-boo, maybe a major boo-boo, but not a crisis. I don't think that personally that the two bank failures equals a crisis. So I just want to quickly ask each one of you just a yes or no. Do you think this is a crisis, Mr. Barr? As I said at the outset, I, I think our system is sound and resilient. Is it a crisis or a yes or no? I, I think that it was appropriate use of the systemic risk exception to prevent a crisis. Is it a crisis, yes or no? As I said, I, I think that where we are now, the banking system is sound and resilient. There was risk that if we did not invoke the systemic but risk exception, would you have used the word crisis is the question. I, I have not used that word. Okay. Uh, Chairman Greenberg? I, I think we were at risk of crisis, and I think the actions that we took have stabilized the system. Ms. Yang? I agree with that. The actions we took stabilized the system. Well, I think you're right, and I think that's what we should focus on, on the swift action over a weekend, no less, uh, and how we were able to avert a crisis and how we were able to prevent contagion and how we were able to, to frankly, just save those banks, but potentially other banks. And I know that recently, as, as a ranking member mentioned, there's been some uh, notion that it's the woke policies that have done this. And I know that some extreme MAGA Republicans like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis have even suggested that it was the ESG policies and fr frankly with zero evidence. Um, but yet they continue with some of this rhetoric. 
Uh, Vice Chair Bart, yes or no again, do you believe that ESG investing played any role in the failure of Silicon Valley Bank? No. Mr. Grinberg? Uh, no. Ms. Lang? Um, I do not have the information that the supervisors have, but I would, my, my uh, strong preference would be no. Right. Well, Nick, you know, as I said, there's been no evidence, and, and thank you for reaffirming that. Because you will re re recall that the claim that ESG invested was caused by the failure of Silicon Valley Bank is really strongly reminiscent of the claim back in 2008 uh, that the financial crisis then was because of the re Community Reinvestment Act obligations. So very similar. Uh, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission examined this claim and rejected it, as did researchers within the Federal Reserve. Vice Chair Barr, would you remind us what researchers at the Fed have concluded about attempts to blame the housing and foreclosure crisis on historically disadvantaged communities of color? The, the research showed that there is no basis for the conclusion that uh, low-income, moderate-income consumers' uh, households uh, were responsible for causing the financial crisis. Okay. Uh, do you think that the Communities of color, the disadvantaged communities, and particularly people in my district, that is 77% uh, Latino, should be concerned that, that this um, bank failures and some of the remedies that are being put in place may cause uh, a lack of, of, of capital, the lack of, of uh, opportunities to be able to, to buy homes? Will it impact mortgage rates? I think the steps that we took together to stabilize the economy and provide uh, public confidence in the banking system uh, are of assistance uh, to low and moderate income households and to all Americans around the country. But do you think it's, there will be some negative impact on interest rates and inability to borrow, uh, to buy and purchase homes? My, my um, estimate is that the bank's reaction to um, the current economic circumstances are likely le to lead to uh, a reduction in credit availability overall. That's something that we're watching very carefully at the Federal Reserve. Right. And Ms. Singh, I had a question for you about crypto, and, and I know that there's an additional bank that is going through some process of, of voluntary liquidation. What role did crypto play in all this? Um, I don't I don't believe crypto played a direct role in either of the failures. Um, so that, yeah. Was there an indirect role? I know that Signature had activities involved in, in digital assets, um, but I don't believe that is the main. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The, Mr. The Chairman, I will still. follow up uh, with the, um, the three panel members on this issue. Thank you. Are you the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman Grunberg, I want to talk a little bit about Signature Bank. Can you describe the condition of Signature Bank at the time of its receivership and what evidence you had that showed Signature was also facing liquidity crunch on March 10th? And what was Signature's availability, available funding at the time uh, New York State DFS closed the bank and placed it at FDIC Thank receivership? You. Congressman, we can get you the specific data, but the fact is that on Friday night, that bank um, had real difficulty meeting its obligations at the end of the day and barely met them by the 5.30 uh, closing time. And I think both New York State and, and the FDIC, who jointly had responsibility, uh, did not think that the bank could open and make it through the day on Monday. I think that was the, the determination, and that's why the New York State on Sunday uh, decided to, to close the institution. All right, and you can get me the uh, specific numbers? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. And I, now I want to focus, I, I want to follow up on something that uh, my colleague Tom Emmer uh, asked before. When New York Community Bank Corp assumed its signatures, deposits, and some of its loans, it refrained from including roughly $4 billion of deposits related to signatures, digital assets, banking business. As a result, Signet, uh, signatures, real-time payments network remained under FDIC Commission's receivership. It was reported early yesterday even, evening that the FDIC sent a notice to depositors whose deposits were not included in uh, NYCB's bid, informing them that 
any accounts not closed by April 5th will be automatically shut and depositors will receive a check in the mail. Can you walk me through FDIC's reasoning for this decision? Uh, yes, Congressman. So the, the, um, the winning bid for signature by New York Community Bank's uh, subsidiary, Flagstar, um, was for all the deposits except the uh, winning bid chose not to bid on the digital assets. And there were about four billion of those. And we provided those depositors a couple of weeks to determine what they might want to do. And we sent them a notice that we'll return their deposits to them um, by early next week, I believe. So in your response to, Ms. to Tom uh, Emmer, you mentioned that Signet was, was included in the sale of Signature Bank, while the deposits were not. It is my understanding that you still currently are looking for, so you're still currently looking for a buyer. So just so I'm clear, the, the, the digital deposits are being returned to their deposit holders. It's my understanding that Signet was not acquired okay. and remained in the receivership and is the process, in the process now of being marketed. So it's, Signet is still under FDIC? Yes, yes, it's, it's okay. in the process. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman Bloomberg, I, I also want to bring this up. In, in the Senate banking hearing yesterday, there was an exchange between Senator Van Hollen and Vice Chair Barr on the guidance, of, on guidance on guidance issued in 2018 and codified in 2021 when Randy Quarles was Vice Chair of the Supervision of the Federal Reserve uh, Board of Governors. This has become a target of uh, some even though this initiative doesn't limit any action an, ag an agency can, can take. It simply clarifies which actions will be accomplished through regulatory measures and which through su supervisory measures. You stayed silent during the entire exchange, but I recently read an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal written by Randy Quarles, which has said that both you and Lael Brainerd voted for this guidance. Is that true? Did you vote for this guidance? Yes, we did, Congressman. Thank you very much. And uh, one more question. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman Barr, if we look back at the events over the past couple of weeks, there have been a number of similarities identified between Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. The first, which is uh, the first of which is being the high concentration of deposits well above the FDIC insurance limit with reports showing that 90% for Signature Bank and 87% for SVB. And the second being the lack of diversity in both banks' deposits. The news has discussed the potential impacts of these similarities at Nozem. However, I would like to explore how the, FDIC, how the Federal Reserve and the FDIC view deposit diversification as it pertains to de determining the soundness of financial institutions. Sorry, I couldn't hear the last four words of your sentence. <laughs> I would like to, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll submit this question for you to respond uh, on the record. Thank you so much. The gentleman yields. The gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Williams, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by making it clear that the failures of the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were not just about wealthy people as some of the narrative that we've heard in conversation. There is a significant chance of a disastrous impact on hardworking people who are trying to make payroll, and it's important that this detail doesn't get lost in the shuffle. The weekend that SVP, that SVB failed, I woke up to text messages from constituents asking what the government was going to do, what kind of intervention there would be, because they had money in this bank. Atlanta is this booming area for tech startups, and so the impact was felt very real by my constituents. They wanted to know if they would be able to access their funds on Monday morning. Black-owned businesses were worried about paying their employees. Entrepreneurs who are creating wealth in marginalized communities were concerned about covering basic business expenses. These businesses are closing the racial wealth gap, which unfortunately my home district of Atlanta leads the nation. And the banking system has to work for them. Chair Gruenberg, in the aftermath of SVP, SVB's failure, there has been substantial debate about raising the 250,000 deposit insurance cap to minimize any potential payroll disruptions and economic pain that may follow when the next bank fails, which my constituents were so concerned about. There is reportedly bipartisan legislation in the works to temporarily raise the cap. 
If the cap is raised or eliminated to help protect depositors, we'll need to take measures to reduce the risk of moral hazard. One proposed measure is the continuance of risk price deposit insurance premiums. Chair Grimberg, as we consider different deposit insurance reforms, should we seek to maintain risk price deposit insurance? Well, I think we do want to maintain risk price deposit insurance, but I do think, you know, you, you change one part of the system, it impacts another part of the system. So, as I indicated earlier, uh, the FDIC is undertaking a comprehensive review of the deposit insurance system in light of this episode and will uh, release a report by May 1, uh, also laying out policy considerations for changes to the system that we hope will inform the discussion around this. So beyond the report, moving forward, what steps can the FDIC take when making decisions about deposit insurance assessments to make banks think twice about various financial stability threats that disproportionately impact marginalized communities? Well, we, we have authority now to do risk-based pricing, and I think it's fair to say that in light of this experience, we need to think hard about liquidity risk and concentrations of uninsured deposits and how that's evaluated in terms of deposit insurance assessments. But I also think it's an appropriate moment to take a look at how our system works in light of what is, uh, of this episode and, and consider what other changes uh, might, be, might be prudent. Thank you. And we all know that part of maintaining a healthy banking system is confidence, specifically consumer confidence, that their money is safe in the banks that they've chosen. People of color have a harder time getting affordable loans from the largest banks and thus turn to the community banks, min minority depository institutions, and the like. And when there is fear in the financial sector or an economic downturn, minority-owned banks and community financial institutions are hit hard as customers transfer their funds to what they think are safer and larger banks. Vice Chair Barr, what can Congress do to strengthen and support community and minority-owned banks in situations like we just experienced? Thank you very much, uh, Representative Williams. I, I, I agree with you that uh, having a wide diversity of kinds of institutions in our country is really critical, including community banks and regional banks, minority depository institutions and community development banks. All of these institutions, I think, are really important for economic vibrancy and inclusion in our, in our society. We'd be happy to, to work with you on ways that we can continue to support those institutions going forward. Happy to work with you, and we will definitely follow up. And Chair Gruenberg, I would love to hear from you what kind of deposit insurance reforms would help support minority depository institutions and other community banks. That's an interesting question. You know, we, uh, we're in the process of uh, finalizing a major revision of the Community Reinvestment Act, and in the proposed rulemaking, there were specific provisions to encourage banks uh, to work with and support minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions. So I think that's actually an, an important vehicle and opportunity to strengthen our MDIs and CDFIs, which, which uh, serve um, LMI communities. And it's an interesting, we should give some thought in our review whether uh, deposit insurance you know, may play into this as well. And I have many more questions, but we're going to work together on this, and my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, did you originally believe that inflation was temporary and transitory? Yes or no? Uh, I was not on the Federal Reserve Board at that time. Did, did you believe it was temporary and transitory, or you, you had no opinion? Uh, I would say at that time I did not have an informed opinion. You did not have an informed opinion if it was temporary and transitory. The Federal Reserve continued to call inflation temporary and transitory until Q4 of 2021. The Biden administration continued to call inflation temporary and transitory. In t I apologize. The Federal Reserve Q4 of 2021. Biden administration Q1 of 2022 following the Russia invasion of Ukraine. That's when they stopped calling it, it temporary and transitory. Would the challenges that we saw with SVB have taken place if, temp if inflation truly was temporary and transitory? Yes or no? Uh, the, the problems that came about from SVB are from classic interest rate risk management. So if, if, the, if, it, if, inter if inflation was temporary and transitory, then I will make the assumption on your behalf, uh, for, for myself, that interest rates would not have gone up. If interest rates didn't go up in the manner and hold in the way that they are, SVB would not have occurred. 
the, the, the breakdown of the bank? Uh, uh, sir, banks have an obligation to manage interest rates, whether they're going up or going down. It's just classic good banking, and it wasn't done here. Okay, so let me, let me dive in. And yesterday, in response to a question from Senator Rounds following um, the, the matter requiring immediate attention, the MRIA, uh, you noted that there was a challenge in the model that it was, quote, was not at all aligned with reality, end quote. Is that, is that, was that a challenge in modeling in particular interest rates? Or what part of reality was it not connected with? Uh, l let me also say, as I mentioned earlier today, I, I called that an MRIA yesterday, but I meant an MRIA. It was just a staff, mis to staff note mistake. But so it's an MRA on interest rate risk. And, and basically what I meant is that their model showed that they'd earn more money as rates were going up and they were losing more money. So, so interest case. rates was at the core of how it was disconnected from reality? Yes, it was, it was about that's, interest rates. That's fair. So, so here's my challenge. So as I look at the ability to prevent all of this, the Federal Reserve would have had to admit that they were wrong, that inflation was temporary and transitory. I think that's at the core of our conversation here in Congress. I think it continues to do an abysmal job with the administration to bring inflation under control. Let me switch gears if I can uh, pretty substantively here, uh, Vice Chair Barr. Um, I have in front of me the H, the, the H41 uh, from the Federal Reserve, and in particular looking at the loans that the Federal Reserve has made to depository institutions. There has been a significant shift in particular as relates to other credit extensions. Other credit extensions is noted is that the Fed is taking collateral from the FDIC. That account, March 9, zero dollars. March 16th, one week later, 57.6 billion dollars. March 23rd, one week after that, 178.6 billion dollars. So the Federal Reserve is taking collateral from the FDIC and loaning the FDIC money under what statutory authority is the Federal Reserve engaged in that? Uh, sir, the, the Federal Reserve is lending through the discount window uh, to the bridge institutions that were established by the FDIC. So they're lending to banks. There's a provision in the statute that clearly contemplates that. And, and so you're noting that when I read footnote 7 that that would not have fallen under the line of either primary credit or secondary credit? Uh, for, for the purposes of enhancing transparency to the public, that line was broken out so that everybody could see exactly what it was. Okay, that, that is helpful. Then if I can shift to you, uh, Chair Grunberg, um, as we look at this dramatic increase, is there a reason that you used this facility rather than one, selling assets, or two, tapping your line of credit uh, at the Treasury, which I believe is to the tune of $100 billion? Well, we certainly have um, sold assets to meet our liquidity needs. And these bridge institutions are nationally chartered banks eligible uh, to borrow from the Fed and utilize that in order to manage the liquidity situation as well. But is, is there a reason that you're not either A, utilizing in a more substantive way the credit line available from the Treasury, or B, selling assets? And the reason I ask this, so maybe I can be more specific, does the, does the FDIC have the same risk that we're seeing in other banks with unrealized gain or unrealized losses uh, and is that why you're tapping this facility rather than selling assets? Uh, no, we, I mean, we are sell, Congressman, we are selling assets to, uh, to meet the obligations of the failed institution, and we're also managing the liquidity, um, and uh, th these bridge banks have the authority and ability to access the Fed uh, resources. So, you, so you're both selling assets and borrowing from the Fed to the tune of $178 billion at the same time? Uh, for these institutions to meet immediate liquidity demands, which we'll eventually get back. And, and did the Treasury at any time discourage you from taking a loan from the from uh, the line of credit from the Treasury for purposes of addressing the debt ceiling limit? I think there were discussions in regard to that, but I, I think the principal purpose here, frankly, was liquidity management and also to be able to preserve liquidity in our deposit insurance fund. I, I appreciate your time here today. Uh, I yield back. I'll now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Nickel, for five minutes. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses uh, for being here with us today. Um, people in my district are already living paycheck to paycheck, and they're worried about making ends meet. They're already dealing with the rising costs of everyday goods and services, and the last thing they need to worry about right now is their bank or their empl employer's bank failing. That's why I'm working to provide transparency and accountability to this process. Where were the regulators? 
I want to know what the bank executives were doing in the months, weeks, and days leading up to this failure. My constituents deserve to know that we're going to hold bank executives accountable and ensure that this doesn't happen again. These bank failures rattled our financial system. Working families in my district need a stable economy they can rely on. They can't afford more uncertainty when it comes to their next paycheck. And right now, the looming debate over the debt ceiling crisis has the ability to rattle our economy even further. So, Vi Vice Chair Barr, in just a few months, the United States Congress needs to raise the debt ceiling. If the U.S. defaulted on the debt, would it be really bad for our economy? Would it be really, really bad for our economy? Or would it be really, really, really bad for our economy? Uh, the, the, the basic answer to that question is that the Congress needs to increase the debt ceiling, that uh, there, there's not other options around that. It, uh, in the absence of an increase in the debt ceiling, uh, it, it could cause enormous dislocation to our economy. So one really, two reallys, three reallys? I, I, I wouldn't characterize it. I, I think that it, it's the right thing to do. I think uh, Congress needs to do that and really I'll leave anything else uh, about the debt ceiling up to discussions between the administration and Congress just to say from an economic perspective it would be uh, quite unfortunate. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Barr, the second largest banking failure in the United States history, $42 billion pulled in a day. Who was asleep at the wheel? I, I think in the first instance, as I've said, a bank management is responsible for running the bank. They failed in basic measures of interest rate risk and liquidity risk. They had very many outstanding matters requiring attention, matter requires immediate, uh, immediate attention. They were deficient in governance and controls. They were rated a three overall with respect to the firm, which means they were not well managed. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, it's the job of the bank and their board of directors um, to run themselves the way they should. We, of course, are looking internally at our own supervision and our regulation uh, in looking at ways that we could have forced the firm to do more faster or raise standards so that if the firm got into trouble, they had more capital and liquidity. I certainly hope there's some accountability. Um, Chair Grunberg, moving to you now. Um, uh, First Citizens Bank, which is located in my congressional district, North Carolina's 13th district, uh, was the successful bidder for Silicon Valley Bank. They have a proven track record in this space and are already instilling greater confidence in our banking system. Uh, can you tell us about the evaluation process for the bids that were submitted and what made First Citizens the most attractive bidder? Uh, uh, two reasons I'd say, Congressman. One, um, financially it was the strongest bid for the FDIC. And two, um, it was a um, a bid for all the deposits of the institution and all of the loans of the institution um, so that it provided uh, operational certainty as well. So from both a financial standpoint and an operational standpoint, it was really the, the strongest bid we received. And, and it took a while. You know, why wasn't Silicon Valley Bank purchased sooner? I think that certainly would have created more stability in this situation. If we could have sold it that first weekend, that would have been desirable. The, the fact is, Silicon Valley was a pretty large institution, $200 billion in assets, and pretty complicated in terms of its uh, business activities. So for a potential acquiring institution to do the due diligence over a weekend and reach a conclusion and make a, and it was frankly not practical. And so we set up a bridge institution and uh, for, for both of the failed banks, and we're able in a pretty orderly way to set up bidding processes for each. <clears throat> in fact, for Silicon Valley, uh, we had considerable interest and got a couple of requests for additional time for interested parties to do due diligence. So we extended the, the bid date a couple of times to give people time, and we ended up you know, getting, I think, uh, um, 27 bids from 18 different sources. So it, it ended up being a pretty constructive process. I think. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Cam, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, let's examine what we're discussing here. 
At the time of its failure, Silicon Valley Bank was the 16th largest bank in the United States with its assets more than tripling from 71 billion in 2019 to over 200 billion at the end of 2022. Obviously, we all know banks have its responsibility to manage its operation well. Unfortunately, our economy facing inflation not seen in decades and increasing interest rates, supervisory missteps at the federal and state level fail to correct and mitigate SVB's rapid growth in its balance sheet and management risks. Mr. Barr, yesterday you mentioned that you first heard about SVB's interest risk and liquidity management, uh, those issues back in February of this year. So I want to ask you, who decided to put um, SVB under the horizontal review process, considering there were at least six warnings going back to 2021, and given SVB's risk profile, how did you conclude that the firm did not merit actions beyond the horizontal review process? Uh, thank you, Representative Kim. I, th I think it... Um uh, you know, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out in the review. The supervisors, on, the supervisors on the ground saw the risk that you described, saw the interest rate risk, and saw the liability risk. Um, they uh, required the firm to make changes. The firm didn't make those changes in times. So the concern of supervisors grew. You can see that from the fall of 21 to the deficiency rating in, in 22, and then further action that year. But you're absolutely right that at the end of the day, the bank failed. And so well, we need to look at... Well, it seems to me, reclaiming my time, uh, it seems to me that you could have considered downgrading ratings or considering um, enforcement actions. And to me, it seems that supervisors kicked the can down the road and couldn't consider the full consequences of the, uh, the inaction. But I want to ask the next question. Um, in February, the Fed reported in its January senior loan officer's opinion survey that it is seeing tighter credit conditions. So, and it's, uh, so it seems to me SVB's failure will only serve to exacerbate the tighter credit conditions. So I'm worried that as entrepreneurs, they will soon find it more difficult to get a loan or a credit to expand their businesses and hire workers due to tighter credit conditions. So, Mr. Barr, I want to ask you, how will you consider tighter credit conditions as part of your holistic capital review and Vossler III endgame reforms? So, we're looking to um, review our capital requirements not for the current situation, but for the long term. Uh, any capital requirements that we consider would go through notice and comment rulemaking and have a transition period, so they would not apply to the current economic circumstances that we're in. We're thinking about, about the long-term effects. We are, of course, paying attention to mm -hmm. tightening credit conditions as part of our monetary policy decisions. Those factor into our forecast for the economy and, therefore, into our interest rate decisions. Well, I'm asking you to please uh, pause and keep the current market volatility and uncertainty in mind as you do that. Uh, let me ask you, Mr. Um, uh, Grunberg, uh, a question. Yesterday, you stated that you received two private bids um, to purchase SVB. Um, this is after the FDIC was appointed as a receiver, and you said one was invalid because it did not get the approval of the board. And the second one indicated it was more expensive than liquidation. So in your prepared statement, you mentioned that the cost to the deposit insurance fund of resolving SVB will cost about $20 billion. Uh, can you tell us why FDIC board decided to deny the first bid? And did you see the second bid as more expensive than the $20 billion uh, incurred by the insurance fund? Well, I, I think the, uh, the point is that neither bid uh, was um, less expensive than liquidation. So liquidation would have been a less costly alternative than, than either acquisition at that point. And frankly, the limited bids and the quality of the bids we received was a function of the very compressed time frame because we had just taken over the institution Friday morning and this was uh, Sunday afternoon. And we thought it was in 
the interest of the deposit insurance fund uh, to uh, place the institution into a bridge so that we could manage it for a brief period of time and then organize an open bidding process so that interested parties would have a fair opportunity uh, to bid on the institution. And that's ultimately what happened. And it would be helpful be glad to respond in writing. I know that would be fantastic. And with that, we'll recognize uh, Ms. Pedersen of Colorado for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am the last on the list, I believe. I uh, always am. So I just want to thank you all for being here today. Well, we're members of Congress. We don't rate it that way. <laughs> if we can restart our time. I'm sorry to interrupt. My apologies. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I really appreciate this incredibly important discussion. Um, there are numerous areas that need to be examined to better understand the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. But first, I want to thank you and the boards of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Secretary for your leadership, um, ultimately bringing the resolution needed to stabilize the banking system and protect depositors. I heard, I had text messages and emails and phone calls from constituents and from people across Colorado who were absolutely uh, terrified that they were going to lose everything and that they were going to be unable to make payroll. So uh, while the response took some time, and I think it did foster a lot of uh, misinformation being spread, ultimately, um, thank you so much for doing what was necessary to, to protect our economy. Um, but we're, of course, here today because we want to make sure that we're learning from what could have been done better and evaluating what we need to do in changing times. And I think that one of the most challenging issues that each of us face um, in this committee and for all of you is how we adjust our regulations and responses in a time when information spreads like wildfire. And in this case, created a panic across our system and threatened our entire economy. Previously, a bank run would take days. In 2008, Washington Mutual saw over 16 billion in withdrawals over 10 days. With SVB, the bank run happened in a matter of hours, with a record 42 billion being withdrawn in a single day. And while SVB clearly wasn't managing their risk and was not listening to the warnings from the FDIC, I don't think any bank could have survived a run like this. And so, Mr. Grunberg, knowing that this panic occurred through social media in response to the su suggestion that not all depositors would be protected when the FDIC took over SVB, what lessons can regulators take from this to improve their public communication when a future bank fails and um, knowing how quickly depositors can immediately move their money in this new technological age? And specifically, I know you're going to uh, take time and we'll hear a lot more about this in the future. Um, but what do you think is needed to expedite the responses necessary to mitigate something like this from happening again? Well, to prevent it from happening again really raises all the supervisory and regulatory issues we've been talking about this morning. I do think in regard to deposit insurance, um, we should do more and perhaps a better job of explaining to the public how deposit insurance works, what is covered, what is not covered, what are the options available uh, to people when they, when they open a bank account. And I think that would also be one of the reasons to undertake this overall review of the deposit insurance system to see what changes might be considered that would that would be helpful to the public. Great, thank you for that. And last, uh, Vice Chair Barr, in just a couple of weeks, we've seen these two bank failures. We've seen efforts to prop up First Republic Bank, and we've also seen issues with Credit Suisse and the Deutsche Bank in Germany. I'm still getting questions from people in my district who are concerned. And so what message do you have for them, for our constituents and small businesses, to reassure them that our financial system is stable and that their money is secure? Well, I, I think that's an excellent point. I know when, when many of you talk to banks, you know, in your own um, in districts, they're telling you the same thing, which is that, that banks are sound and resilient. I think if you look at the actions we took uh, a couple and a half weeks ago, those actions demonstrate that we're committed to ensuring that all deposits are safe. We're prepared to use those tools for any size institution as needed. 
if appropriate, to keep the system safe and sound. So the basic message is that the banking system is sound and resilient. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I yield back. And congratulations, since I'm the last one. <laughs> uh, well, uh, gentlelady yields back. Uh, the last one on the Democratic side. Uh, so panelists don't get too excited. Um, we'll now have... Uh, we have two. Oh, we have two? I'm sorry, Chairman Meeks. I'm very sorry. Um, that's not getting better news for you guys. Sorry. Um, we'll now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, panelists. I know it's already been an interesting day. Thanks for being here. Uh, Vice Chair Barr says here you were confirmed July 19th, 2022. So you came in kind of in the middle, according to your own testimony, of when the San Francisco Fed was having examinary issues at SVB. Is that fair? The examiner um, uh, re report with respect to the whole firm as a whole was done in, in July 2022, and, and that's when I arrived. Okay. According to your testimony, you say here at the end of 21, supervisors at the SF Fed found deficiencies with bank liquidity risk, um, the resulting in six supervisory, supervisory findings. In May of 22, there were three additional findings associated with ineffective board management, et cetera. In October of 22, supervisors met with the bank's senior management um, to express concerns about the interest rate profile. In February 23rd of 2023, your staff alerted you to these issues, and then we know the rest of the story. Is it your assessment that there are serious supervisory issues at the San Francisco Fed? We're doing the review of that now, and I, I don't want to prejudge the outcome of it. There were clearly supervisors. Well, Mr. Barr, I'm not going to ask you to prejudge. I'm going to prejudge. As, a, as an American citizen, as a member of Congress, don't you think it's unnecessary? It is a rational judgment that if all these supervisory findings were existing for the last two years, and this still resulted that there are supervisory issues, supervisory issues at the at the San Francisco Fed. Sorry, was that that, that yeah, was a question? Yeah. Yeah. Do, you think it's a, do you think it's a good assumption to make? Um, I, I don't want to assume. I want to go look at the facts. We're going to go look at the facts in this review. I, I think that overall, you know, at the Federal Reserve, without pointing any fingers in any direction, that, that there were significant supervisory failings. I, I said that at the outset of the hearing, that if you have a bank like this that's failing, there are serious management issues, there are supervisory failings, there are regulatory failings, and, and we're committed okay. to looking at all of those. Yeah, that's fair. Let me, let me throw this out to you. Mr. Chairman, for the record, I want to put it to the record. Wall Street Journal article dated November 11th, 2022, rising interest rate hikes, bank hit bank bond holdings. In this article, it is actually a comment in here by Thomas Honig, uh, former president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, former chairman of the former vice chairman of the FDIC, and he says, if they go high enough, you can actually be losing money on those assets. He was generally speaking about banks, but not specific banks. This is highlighting that his concern, somebody who is in a part of your shoes and Mr. Groomberg's shoes, was concerned about rising interest rates on bank portfolios writ large. Do you agree with that statement? Yes, I think interest rate risk, again, is a core risk. We look at it across the system, and banks are supervised for that. It, it is absolutely essential they manage that risk. Mr. Barr, let me ask you a question. Do you think that this committee should be talking to uh, SF, uh, SF uh, Fed President Mary Daly? Do you think uh, that she would have some color on these issues that happened at Silicon Valley Bank? I, I think, you know, the the – committee's decisions about witnesses is far outside my expertise. Let me ask you this question, because actually we've been talking a lot about concerns from a supervisory perspective. You have a speech dated March 9th, 2023, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics here in D.C. March 9th is an interesting day. That's the day that SVB blew up. In your speech, you say, the banks we regulate in contrast, in contrast to stable coins and crypto markets, are well protected from bank runs through a robust array of supervisory requirements. You still stand by that statement? As I said earlier in the hearing, I, I, I think that it demonstrates the need for humility about our ability to understand the causes and consequences of, of financial difficulties. So 
Uh, of course, that statement um, in this context is uh, turned out to be incorrect. Okay, that's fair. Let me ask you just uh, a couple, one last thing. And Mr. Chairman, for the record, I also have another article I want to submit. Uh, the U.S. needs a new bank supervisory system, written by Peter Wellison, uh, who is at the American Enterprise Institute. And in part, it talks about some of the shortcomings of the current supervisory system. In short, I will say this in the final 22 seconds of my testimony. It's been for the last 14 years in Congress, we viewed Dodd-Frank as the holy grail for safe and sound banking. And if we're gonna be honest with ourselves, what has been the holy grail for quote unquote, safe and sound banking is cheap or free money for balance sheets to look good but when rates rise, not all balance sheets look good. And that's not just banking, that's in a lot of places. So maybe we should take a look at our supervisory system overall. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chairman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you to the Chairman and Ranking Member and to the regulators for appearing before the committee. Uh, I wanna start by saying the work uh, that was done to um, address the Silicon Valley and Signature Bank collapse and ensure the health and resiliency of the U.S. banking system uh, is, is vital. And I want to commend uh, those that were involved in the swift action and the decisive steps that were taken to protect businesses' payroll, particularly small businesses and their employees who we heard from uh, at that time. Now, while depositors were protected, shareholders and bondholders need to bear the cost for any potential mismanagement. And I'm eagerly awaiting the full examination of these bank uh, reviews and the upcoming reports that you will be providing. Now, while the collapse of the Silicon Valley and Signature Bank may have occurred due to unique and isolated factors, the panic that their failures caused quickly became a private uh, or a sector-wide issue. And I'm glad to say that the original crisis of confidence was subsided uh, and cooler heads did prevail. I fear that the consequences will continue to materialize um, as we go on. For example, consolidation of deposits within the largest systemically important banks will only continue if the sense of risk within the financial system persists. Uninsured depositors are leaving our mid-sized banks because they feel that their money is safer elsewhere, even as these banks showed continued strength and sound financial footing. Deposit insurance is crucial for many of my constituents to get a sense of peace of mind, and we cannot have the perception of a two-tiered banking system in this country where only the largest banks are protected. So Chairman Grunberg, as we look to increase confidence in the banking system with a particular focus on small and medium banks, how would an increase in the FDIC insurance limit prevent further consolidation of deposits at the largest banks? Well, I think, Congressman, uh, I think that question is raised by this episode. The decision to guarantee the uninsured deposits of these two institutions really have implications for the entire deposit insurance system, and we need to consider it. And I'd like to do it uh, comprehensively, looking at all the aspects of our deposit insurance regime, and then come back uh, by May 1 with a report that the FDIC will put out, which will also provide uh, some policy options for consideration. All right, one other area that I'm concerned about, I've already heard uh, multiple development projects, particularly housing projects, in my district that are struggling to get financing due to a pull up back of credit from community banks. While I understand the need to review capital requirements, I think you'd agree, Vice Chair Barr, that no bank can meet $40 billion plus in depositor demands from capital alone. So Vice Chair Barr, I would really urge you to consider the effects of increased capital requirements on the lending of healthy community banks However, I do believe that action must be taken, so would you be able to discuss any additional strategies the Fed would be able to pursue to address the problems that we have seen at Silicon Valley and Signature Banks without reducing credit industry-wide? Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
First of all, the capital review that, that we're doing is, does not apply to community banks. Uh, we're not intending to increase capital requirements on community banks. My uh, understanding from looking at the community banking system is that it is well capitalized and stable and is serving its communities. We are looking at larger institutions. If we do that, we're going to do it through a notice and comment rulemaking process. That, that takes a good bit of time and there are transition rules. So we're not talking about capital rules that in any way that would apply now. We're talking about how to make sure that the capital and liquidity rules in the future are appropriate. Okay. And then finally, um, there were reports that after Silicon Valley went into receivership, they literally advertised that their FDIC guarantee a, as a way to attract depositors. Is that true? And if so, what's being done? They cannot now benefit from the policy after we uh, help save them? That's a fair question, Congressman. The, we placed Silicon Valley into a bridge institution. There may have been some communications of the kind you de described. When we heard about it, we put it into it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Someone from Nebraska, Mr. Flood, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Vice Chair Barr, you've disclosed that Silicon Valley Bank's composite CAMELS rating was a three out of five. In response to Ranking Member Waters' question earlier, you disclosed that their liquidity rating was a much stronger two out of five. Furthermore, you testified that the Federal Reserve examiners cited Silicon Valley Bank seven separate times, and you testified that examiners were aware of Silicon Valley Bank's interest rate risk last year. Why wasn't that risk reflected in Silicon Valley Bank's liquidity rating? I think it's an excellent point. Uh, one of the things we're looking at the review is given the extent of difficulties, the problems the firm was having, how did the regulators come up with this particular, the supervisors come up with this particular approach? Its composite rating was not well managed, uh, and its holding company rating was deficient, that is also not well managed. But it has a two for liquidity and it conditionally meets expectations for liquidity. And so we're trying to understand how that is consistent with the other material. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, too, that, you know, I'm highlighting the liquidity and, and governance and interest rate risk findings, but there were many other findings at the firm um, that, that had not been addressed at the time they failed. And so the question is, you know, why wasn't that escalated? Why wasn't act, further action taken? I think it's, it's a legitimate and fair question. Was that composite score, that composite CAMELS rating, ever downgraded in 2021? following the examiner's citations? Um, I, I don't know the answer to uh, what happened in 2021. The 2022 rating was the first time the firm had a composite rating for all of its activities as it entered the large and foreign banking organization group. Vice Chair Barr, was Silicon Valley Bank's liquidity rating ever downgraded following the examiner's citations in 2022, or is that the same issue as you just described with the large bank status, their liquidity rating? The, the, the overall rating for the firm of which this would be a part was done that summer. There was a process after that of looking at both liquidity risk and interest rate risk. And my understanding is, is part of the horizontal review that was being conducted uh, at the beginning of 2023, the examiners were looking at, you know, what was the, what was the appropriate level? Okay, every quarter, the FDIC releases its quarterly banking profile. This profile includes a public disclosure of the total assets of FDIC-insured institutions that are deemed, quote-unquote, problem banks. In December of 2022, the FDIC's problem bank list included total assets of only $47.5 billion dollars. Although the banks on the FDIC's problem list are not public, given the size of Silicon Valley Bank, it's reasonable for me to conclude that Silicon Valley Bank was not on the FDIC's problem bank list, released just three months before its collapse. Mr. Chairman, given the several supervisory findings identifying various issues with Silicon Valley Bank's practices since 2021, including the issuance of matters requiring immediate attention from those supervisors, were those findings communicated to the F FDIC? I can tell you, Congressman, that the criteria to get on the problem bank list is to be rated a four or five on the CAMELS rating scale of one to five. And at that time, Silicon Valley was 
not rated a four or five, so we wouldn't have been in a position to put it on the problem bank list. Vice Chairman Barr, why wasn't this information shared for the purposes of the FDIC's problem bank list? As, as Chairman Grumman just indicated, the FDIC makes an independent judgment uh, with respect to its list based on the ratings of the firm, and the firm was not rated uh, lower than, than a three. Chairman Gruenberg, has Silicon Valley Bank ever previously been on the FDIC's list of problem banks? Um, <laughs> the reason I hesitate is we don't, we, we put the aggregate assets of the institutions on the problem list. Uh, we uh, don't indicate the individual institutions. Here you can do yeah, that. Yeah, no, I take your and point. this is a I'll question from point. Congress. Yeah, well, I, I believe I can come back and answer your question. If I may, yeah. we follow up for the record, but be glad to do that. I just want to check, but yes, the answer is we'll come back with an answer. The answer, the answer is yes? We will come back with an answer for you if that's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I still think there are lots of questions uh, regarding what happened here, especially with Silicon Valley Bank, and I appreciate your time. I yield back. I'm going to uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank all of you for your your, your uh responsibilities and the duties and what you've done. You know, it's funny when you've been here for a while, you know, a lot of folks are here talking about Dodd-Frank should not be the golden wheel, but if you were here in 2008 when there was no Dodd-Frank, that was a crisis. That was something, this is nothing, I mean, I wish some of my colleagues uh, who are here, who were not here, <laughs> we are a long way away from where we were in 2008. And the bank's system is much stronger now than it was 2008. And I say thank God that we had uh, Dodd-Frank uh, at that particular time. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, and, and, but as a result, let me just ask, maybe uh, Vice uh, Chair Barr, uh, as part of your internal review, you've indicated that you plan to evaluate whether the application of more stringent, stringent standards would have prompted as SVB to better manage risks. So as part of that, do you expect to look into whether more frequent stress testing for a bank of SVB's size would be appropriate? Yes, Representative Beeks, we'll look at stress testing. We'll look at really all the enhanced prudential standards, liquidity standards, capital standards, stress testing. All of that will be part of our review with respect to SVB, and it'll help inform broader questions we've been working on since I arrived in July about what the capital framework for the system should look like. Now, uh, are stress test results for our largest banks, those that are above uh, $250 billion, are they, uh, they, they are available to the public, is that not correct? Yes, the uh, stress testing results uh, are available uh, annually uh, to the public. And I understand that because of SVP's rapid growth and the timing of when the bank crossed the 100 billion dollar asset threshold, SVB would not have been subject to stress testing until 2024. But when a bank with about 100 billion in asset size is subject to stress testing, who has access to those results? Would, would, would for example, an individual or small business client of the bank uh, be able to see those results? So under the current framework you correctly described, the Federal Reserve's rules established in 2019 would provide that SVB would be subject for the first time to stress testing in 2024. There is currently under that structure that was in, put in place in 2019, no, no stress testing for firms um, below the 100 billion level. Uh, and and that's, um, that's part of the framework. So could you, could you expound a little bit more on uh, how helpful it might be for a depositor, for example, to get to see those results, especially depositors who are uninsured, that have uninsured deposits? So, so stress testing results for the firms that are in stress testing, stress testing are published annually. Um, for firms that are below that level in the current framework, they're not required for that kind of stress test. They do do internal uh, liquidity stress tests as a normal part of their requirements on a quarterly basis. That, that's an internal proprietary um, action by them subject to supervisory review. 
in the case of SBV, they conducted their liquidity stress test, but the, the supervisors found that those stress tests essentially were not stressful enough. They were not realistic. So, I mean, that's, you know, but I believe there's an issue that uh, customers and investors who bank with institutions that are large enough to have triggered a systemic risk exception do not have the transparency uh, into the risk management and scenario plan that, uh, that their banks may have underway. But um, in the limited time I have, let me, let me just ask, just follow up on a couple of questions that some other people had asked. Uh, I am uh, thinking about small banks and community banks, which are very important, and talking about depository insurance, and I know someone was talking about that. Now, to me, not a lot of people, especially in the community banks, uh, have uh, $250,000 in the bank. So this would, but in trying to help strengthen those banks, what I would like to see is some of the small businesses may have more than 250000 in the bank, uh, and they have to pay employees. And I would like them to be giving them some business. So do you think that, and I don't know, but that, that there should be some, when you look at depository insurance, a difference between small businesses and personal, you know, as far as that's concerned going forward? Congressman, that's a, that's a good question, and it's, it's one of the things we'll be looking at in the report that we're going to submit on May 1 and laying out some policy considerations to, uh, to take into account here. Thank you. I'm out of time, so I'll yield back. Another gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Lawler, is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Grunberg, just to follow up on that line of questioning, uh, yes or no, should the FDIC insurance limit be raised? <laughs> um, let us do the work on this uh, and, and then come back to you with a, with a report. Well, in, the, in, the, in the 2008 collapse, we raised it from 100 to 250,000. We made it permanent in 2010. It has not been raised since then. Do you think it should be raised? I don't know the answer to that question right now, Congressman. Okay. Um, did the Fed, the FDIC, and the Treasury have the tools needed to deal with this crisis when you were made aware of the situation with SVB? Do you all believe, yes or no, that you had the tools needed to deal with this? Yeah, yes, we have the tools we yes. need. Yes. I agree, yes. Yes. I agree we had the tools. To okay. Did the, did the Fed, the FDIC, and the Treasury have the tools needed to prevent it? Yes or no? I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. I don't have a yes or no answer for it. I, I think we can do better at supervision and regulation, but whether we could have prevented the collapse in 24 hours of this institution, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I agree with Michael's point, but from a supervisory basis, I think there was an opportunity. I'm sorry, Congressman, yeah. can you repeat your question? Yes or no, do you think the Treasury had the tools needed to prevent this from happening? The Treasury had the tools to use the systemic risk exception. And um, used it. And recommendation okay. to prevent a crisis. So uh, the FDIC and the Treasury do believe it. The Fed, not sure yet. But so in that, in that case, do you think the Federal Reserve failed here in its, in its role? I, I think fundamentally, as I've said, it's the responsibility of bank management to run the bank. The bank managers failed in basic risk management. Right, but you provided the, – the Federal, the Federal Reserve and the San Francisco Fed provided guidance, provided notices, and failed to follow up on that, correct? Uh, I, I would say that there was follow-up. The question is whether the follow-up was stringent enough, and that's part of the review we're looking at. But stringent enough – really means that the individual people may or may not have done the job that they were supposed to do, correct? Because if you give the notice and you reach out, isn't it incumbent on the individual uh, supervisors to actually follow up and make sure that the bank is doing what it needs to do? It's incumbent on the bank to take the actions that the supervisors are directing them to take, and it's incumbent on the supervisors to check on that. And Did the supervisors case, fail to check on that? Uh, no, I, I didn't say that. What, what I said is that it's incumbent on the supervisors to do that. I think it's a legitimate. Did they do that? I think it's a legitimate and fair question to ask whether they were stringent enough.
whether they used enough tools to force the bank manager that, to do that was obviously right. With respect, that is semantics. Did they, did they do the job they were supposed to do? Did they follow up? The, the reason I'm having difficulty answering the question is I believe they did follow up, but the bank managers did not perform on the job, okay. and that's why we're looking. Were, were California and New York re regulators equipped with the appropriate tools to handle this? Uh, or should these banks, specifically SVB, uh, given their size, been federally chartered instead of state chartered? I, I think that our country benefits from having a wide diversity of kinds and sizes of institutions and the diversity of chartering authorities that we have. So I'm not recommending that we change that. Okay. Uh, when did any of you first speak with Superintendent Harris regarding Signature Bank? Just date. Please. I'd want to check the record on that if I may I would come back to you. I just want to be sure we're accurate. Okay. Do either of you know when you first spoke to Superintendent Harris? Uh, I do not. I mean, Signature Bank is an FDIC in New York state regulated institution, but I, I don't know when I first had a conversation about it. Okay. Um, Chairman Grunberg, when was the decision made to close Signature Bank and uh, what criteria were used uh, to determine uh, whether or not Signature Bank met the systemic risk exception? Those are two questions, Congressman. The, the, uh, the decision to close the bank is the authority on, for the state, and the state uh, made that decision on, on Sunday. And the, um, what was the question in regard to the systemic risk exception? What criteria was used to determine that? Oh, I, well, I think we had uh, before us the um, – a failure of two institutions, um, uh, both Silicon Valley and Signature. And we also had before us evidence of significant liquidity stress at other institutions. And we had data in terms of uh, deposit outflows. And I think that was basically uh, the data we relied on in, in, in if, making if, this decision. If the chair will, um, will submit that data for the, for the record yes. and answer for this, yes. would, would you be willing to do that? The data yes, of course. related to systemic risk designation. Yes. Okay. Thank uh, you, or Mr. systemic Chairman. risk event. Uh, we'll now go to the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today. Um, if you would just, with a show of hands, do you believe that, as most Americans do, as I've said and as the President said, that taxpayers should not be on the hook for that? Would you agree with that statement? Yes. Further, would you agree with the statement that we should have diversity within our banking system? Yes, yeah, I agree. Specifically, then, would you be supporting our regional banks, our small local banks, um, and recognize the undue burden that they potentially are going to be saddled with as a result of a FDI assessment because of these two banks? Uh, well, I as you may know, Congressman, I responded to that issue, and the answer is the FDIC has authority under the law to consider who benefits from the assistance provided, and we'll take that into account with particular attention and sensitivity to the impact on community banks. I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Gutenberg. I want to specifically talk um, to Mr. Barr here. The diversity in banks, when you do your holistic capital review of banks under $10 billion, um, what would that look like? Uh, we're, we're not anticipating in any way uh, raising capital requirements with respect to community banks. It's not part of my holistic review. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Second, you know, I'll highlight here $22 billion, as we say in Iowa, that's a lot of money. And, in fact, it's 20 percent of the entire FDIC's um, fund for this. In order to make that up, special assessments will inevitably have to be part of this. Do you see that being passed along to the top banks primarily, or how will you calibrate that? Well, Congressman, it's relevant to the, my response before. Uh, we're required by law to uh, pay for any cost of the deposit insurance fund caused by the coverage of the uninsured deposits through a special assessment. We have to do that by notice and, rule, and public notice and rulemaking. And we have authority under the law to consider the types of entities 
that benefit from any action taken or assistance provided. So I understand that, but I just want to highlight the difference here. We had two banks that had 90% of their depositors un insured in any level. And my most banks across America are at 47%. My state of Iowa, you know, in Des Moines alone at 70%. In my rural guys, it's 7%. I mean, these are farmers who are looking to plant this spring who know that they have a good deposit there. It's small businesses that are supported by this. What they don't need is ultimately, to my original question, a increase on their cost of living, on their cost of doing business by a special assessment that disproportionately punishes those who are at the medium and small size. Are you committed to making sure that's a priority for you? Yes. Excellent. Last question, I wanna be uh, brief here. Silicon Valley Bank did not have a chief risk officer, uh, Mr. Barr, for how many months? Um, I believe it was approximately eight months. So almost a year. During that time, they did have four members who served on something called the Governance and Corporate Responsibility Committee. And these four members were actually on their risk committee, but had no, uh, as I understand it, actual experience in managing material risk. Were these individuals focused on the wrong thing? And was there no true risk management being taken at Silicon Valley Bank in the lead up to the fail? Uh, I can't speak to the particular individuals. I can say that the supervisors told the board of directors uh, and the bank that the board oversight with respect to risk management was deficient. That was one of the findings that was made in the summer of 2022. So then did beginner risk management of interest rate risk and liquidity risk cause this bank to fail, SVB specifically? Yes, ultimately uh, they, they mismanaged their interest rate and their liquidity risk and their very large percentage of uninsured depositors had a, a massive and unexpected run as I said, $42 billion on a Thursday and expected another $100 billion on Friday. And, and that was just a, a devastating uh, run for the institution. So I'd like to ask this question then, and I hope that Mary Daly has the opportunity, Mr. Chair, to testify in person before this committee. But as you're overseeing this, why did she tout the regional Fed's work on cataloging climate risks, even going so far as to assemble a team to study how these risks are likely to impact the Fed's future reserve mandates? And I'll state here that one of SVB's memos from their supervisory credit group claimed they had been working closely with the Fed to inform its agenda priorities, namely fiscal risk to banks from climate change. Were the regulators focused on the wrong risk posed by this administration? Yes or no? The, the supervisors were focused overall on the system on interest rate risk, credit risk, um, uh, cybersecurity risk, traditional risk in the banking system. There are some supervisors who are focused uh, on climate change. But there was no risk officer to look at the actual dramatic overage that they had of this. I'm sorry, you're talking about the bank risk officer? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I yield back my time. I'll submit the rest of the questions independently. Uh, Gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Uh, Ms. Della Cruz is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, witnesses, for being here today. Um, what we've learned in the wake of the first run on a major U.S. bank since the Great Recession is that the management team of Silicon Valley Bank took quite frankly, foolish actions that no informed financial institution should ever make. Now, by taking on deposits from their customers, which is short-term in definition, and buying long-term bonds when interest rates were low, now that is before President Biden's inflation crisis, they chose to become vulnerable. When inflation skyrocketed after enacting the Democrats' partisan $2 trillion American Rescue Plan, the Fed was late to determine that inflation wasn't transi transitory, for forcing a decision to spike interest rates, creating risk in the banking system. Now, if we backtrack for a second and look at what the Federal Reserve was focusing on when they were hiking interest rate. It wasn't the risks associated with those actions. Instead, it was research papers on climate risks and social issues, which you just acknowledged a second ago that some were uh, focused on climate change. My question is to you, Mr. Barr. 
I realize you didn't come into your role until July 2022, but isn't it correct that when you did, you quickly announced your holistic view of Fed regulations and your own Fed special scenario analysis for weather and climate risks? 